All right, where were we? Oh yeah, episode four. It's all downhill from here, folks. We start with a recap that gives us clips from all three episodes in a scattered order so we have no idea what we're looking at. Again! In the latter half of the recap, we're seeing clips from episode one. This show has that little going on, to the point that it feels like it needs to remind the audience of how Maya's mother died. They are still showing us that Maya shot Wilson Fisk. Why? This is the penultimate episode of the series. For context, I started part one of this review on January 15th of 2024, and I began writing this part of the review on February 2nd of the same year. I'm actually in need of some rebriefing, and this shit is fucking useless. This is more of a trailer than a recap. The episode finally starts with young Maya exiting her elementary school and trying to buy some ice cream from the ice cream man, but he doesn't understand ASL. The ice cream man is a massive dick to Maya for no reason. He asks Maya which one, and because we need to make him an ass, he doesn't understand what Maya wants even though she's fucking pointing at it. Why are you even an ice cream man? You know that some kids are going to have disabilities, speech impediments, and social challenges. You should have been prepared for a kid that can't speak or is too shy to speak. Maya, for some reason, doesn't gesture to him that she's deaf. A simple point to her ears as she shakes her head would notify any grown and decently intelligent man that you are deaf. She's been deaf for too long to not be able to communicate to non-ASL users in some basic way. But because we need the next moment to happen, Maya doesn't do this. We cut to a shot of Wilson Fisk glaring at the interaction from his SUV. The ice cream man shoos Maya away and Maya gets into Fisk's car. Reminder, Maya's father, William, is still alive because his death wasn't until Maya was a grown woman. Fisk tells Maya that he has something he needs to do before hounding the ice cream man and beating the shit out of him in an alleyway. Notice how everyone suddenly and conveniently disappears right when Fisk decides to beat the piss out of this guy? Even though everyone disappeared, Fisk screams like a mongrel on acid, making sure everyone can now hear him assaulting this guy. Wait, is this another green screen shot? Look at how blurry the background is. Guys, you shot this in Atlanta. There are plenty of alleys in Atlanta. And CGI blood? Really guys? What was the reasoning behind these decisions? After Fisk beats the ice cream man to the point his face is bleeding, he calls one of his guys and asks him to bring him a new jacket because he doesn't want Maya to see him covered in blood only for Maya to be standing right there, witnessing the whole thing. Why would you assume Maya didn't see you drag this guy into the alleyway? If you look at the shot of Maya running to the SUV, you'll notice this FTC sign on the wall. When Fisk grabs the ice cream man, the sign is still right there, meaning he was within Maya's field of view when he grabbed this guy. Of course she saw what you were doing, you did it right in front of her. And the chauffeur just lets this little girl get out of the car and run to this dark alleyway unsupervised? Seems real contrived if you ask me. It's also pretty clear that Fisk would have the driver killed for allowing Maya to see this assault. Fisk tells Maya not to be afraid, even though he knows she's deaf, but Maya runs up to the ice cream man and kicks him herself, so Maya was always a little shit, huh? Her father's death didn't change her one bit, and as we've established in the previous part, this character is probably going to be turned into a hero when this show has shown us every reason why she shouldn't be one. So what if the ice cream man was a bit of a dickhead? You think it's appropriate to beat the shit out of him to the point that his brain may never function properly ever again? Again, this would be perfectly fine if the show wasn't trying to make Maya a hero in the end. Oh boy, wait till you see the intro to episode 5, this shit gets even worse. And one small note, the folly is terrible with Maya's shoes. Listen. Her shoes sound like the clacking of a grown woman's heels on tile, not a child's school shoes on concrete. We jump ahead to 2021, meaning that both Maya and Fisk survived the snap. Fisk tells Maya that she's ready for her final lesson. Since when was Fisk teaching Maya anything? What lessons was Maya learning? Episode 1 established that Maya was simply working for Fisk, not being mentored by him. A holdover from the original cut that had 8 episodes, perhaps? 
Fisk tells Maya that they can only trust each other. He has the ASL interpreter executed off screen because she knows too much. What a goofball thing to include. You've established that Fisk doesn't know ASL, so why would he have the one person that can help him and Maya communicate executed? On top of that, do you not realize that this woman's death will raise questions and concerns for her family? They will have questions. And finally, when the ASL interpreter is killed, we hear a silenced gunshot. <laughs> I didn't mention this in my last video, but this is inaccurate. I'll explain when we cover the next episode. We jump to the present day after the intro sequence, which is 7 minutes and 21 seconds into a 37 minute episode. A fifth of the episode's runtime is spent on shit that happened before the actual show. We return to Maya staring down Fisk in the front yard of her childhood home. Fisk has his thugs hold Maya's arms as he places a contact lens into her eye. Interesting how Little Miss Edgy here didn't fight them off with ease like she did in the other two episodes she fought people in. This contact lens allows Maya to see little ASL animations that translate what Fisk is saying to her. I have so many questions about this contact lens. This thing can't possibly exist with how small all the tech needed to receive audio, process information, and play back a boatload of stored animations for ASL. How does it know who is talking? How does it know when to send a signal to Fisk's earpiece? Does this work for everyone Maya talks to? Does it need to be recharged? What is the storage solution for this thing? You'd need several gigabytes just for the animations of thousands of ASL gestures alone. And some goofball wingnut knucklehead McSpazitron will probably say, It's probably Stark Tech. Don't you dare bring him into this. As if Tony needed any more hits to his character post Endgame. Why the fuck would Tony give Wilson Fisk anything? Fisk was a complete mystery of a person before he revealed himself in season one of Daredevil, and by the time that happened, Tony was dealing with far bigger issues and had no intention of dealing with a criminal like Fisk. This just reminded me that Fisk had his name plastered on the side of Henry's train depot. Why? Fisk isn't one to simply blast his name all over the place like, say... Trump? So Fisk reveals that he's simply here to have the Sunday family dinner. Maya tells him that it's Thursday. What the hell was that? Was that supposed to be a joke? Why is there a joke in a scene that's supposed to have tension so wound up that even Mr. Fantastic wouldn't be able to survive being twisted this much? Even in Marvel's supposed darker and edgier entry, they simply cannot help themselves when it comes to prematurely defusing tension for the sake of keeping the audience feeling safe and comfortable. Maya and Fisk enter the home and Fisk tells her that he's not angry as he removes his techno patch from his eye. Is that supposed to justify how Fisk survived getting domed? Just putting a whirring, beeping, glowing patch on his eye and it's settled? Boo! You stink! And why do you still have tape on your face if the patch can be removed? Look at this scar. Bro looks like he got an infection instead of getting shot in the fucking face. Fisk tells Maya that he doesn't blame her for wanting him dead and he believes that there's a part of her that is happy he's still alive. Maya assures him that she wanted him dead. Fisk explains that he's disappointed that Maya was ready to believe the worst about her father's murder, alluding to the possibility that she was lied to by Clint. But he never explains what the truth supposedly is. He just tisk tisks her for not believing him. Fisk criticizes Maya for raising a hand to him in violence, but Maya says that violence was always their language. Fisk then says that he always thought Maya saw him as a hero, then Maya says that she used to. Are we ever going to actually explore these characters? All we've done with every conversation is have surface level back and forth about thin, shallow conflicts. We should be exploring why Maya believed Clint with no evidence. We should be exploring why Fisk believes Maya was relieved to see Fisk alive. We should know what the truth behind William's death was and why Fisk supposedly wanted him dead. Maybe even explore the nature of William and Fisk's relationship. Who even was William to Fisk? Why were they so close that William trusted his daughter with Fisk? This is exactly why every character in this show is so fucking empty. We don't explore their emotions, beliefs, connections to other characters, drive behind their actions or motivations. 
Quick tangent, I got a few comments on my Riri Williams sucks video stating that you can make a character that doesn't have the six points I listed in that video. You know what happens when you don't have the six points? You end up with character interactions like this. Empty conversations that go nowhere and inform your audience of nothing. Fisk closes the blinds while some ominous ambience plays in the background. Why the ambience? You already established that Fisk is not going to kill Maya and you've deflated any possible tension in this scene without replacing it with any intrigue about why Fisk is here or what he even wants. Let me propose an alternative. Let's rewind to Fisk and Maya outside. Instead of Fisk saying that he wants to have a Sunday family dinner just like old times, let's have him straight up tell Maya that he has a proposition for her that he thinks she'll like but he'll only go into details if she has the Sunday dinner with him. That way, it forces Maya to play along and makes the audience wonder what this proposition is. In the show, the proposition just gets dropped onto Maya unceremoniously after the two have a nothing conversation. We'll get to that proposition in a moment. Maya offers to open the wine and she pours it out in the sink, which makes sense for someone who doesn't trust the other party. It's better than that time Doctor Strange drank a random drink from a guy he thinks hates him enough to want him dead. But then Maya goes on to tell Fisk that she poured out the wine so I don't get what the point of doing it behind his back was. There is a small moment that shows potential but ends up being a nothing burger. Fisk picks up a picture of Maya's family and stares at it. He then has this puzzled and introspective expression on his face. Could he possibly be jealous of what William had? A wife, daughter, and loving family? Is that why he had William killed? Jealousy? Did he curse William for having a quiet life that Fisk was never able to have himself even as a child? Is he wondering why Maya holds her father up with such high regard while he doesn't get any respect from her no matter what he gives to her? We'll never know because this show never fucking explores this moment. Also interesting that this picture seems to be the only appearance of Bonnie's mother in the entire show. Fisk goes on to try super hard to show Maya that he cares about her, even bringing her favorite cookies from a bakery in New York. Which is a real bakery in New York. After dealing with the insane fucking product placement in Age of Extinction, getting jump scared like this was highly unpleasant. Fisk drops a knife and Maya tries to rush to pick it up, but Fisk beats her to it. She has a look on her face that says she expects the worst. Huh. Subtlety. From Maya? Rare. Fisk hands Maya the knife by the handle, a sign that he is truly there for non-violent means. It's interesting and kinda weird watching these little moments of competency peek out from under the covers of sludge and edginess. Alright, editing room Alistair here, coming in to kneecap this little nice moment we have here, where I notice that in between shots Maya's hand wraps are missing. This show is a train wreck. Fisk reiterates information we just saw from the intro that was less than 8 minutes ago in the runtime, that they can only trust each other. I swear it feels like the intro was added to this episode purely for the context of this conversation and nothing else. Then Fisk says something baffling. He says that Maya can have the empire she wants if she would just go back to New York with him. Why? She hasn't done anything to earn it. She tried to kill you. She blew up your armory. Why are you just giving it to her? Fisk tells Maya that he'll be chilling at the Choctaw Casino until the weekend, and he hopes she leaves with him. I mean, at this point, Maya should accept the offer, right? She doesn't care about anyone but herself, so why not just take Fisk's offer? Fisk tells Maya to think about the offer and leaves. They never touch the food, by the way. This scene is really weird because they wrote Fisk too affably. He comes across less as a crime lord murderer and more like someone's very young grandpa. He doesn't behave in a way that makes you feel like he's going to whip around and do something crazy. He doesn't feel as volatile as he should. That prison scene from season 2 of Daredevil did it right though. We cut to the outside of Henry's skating rink and we see that it is closed for renovations. Yeah, more property damage on Maya's part that she doesn't ever offer to pay to fix. Maya tells Henry that Fisk is handing her... Uh, queen pin. Henry says that Maya can't be that stupid and Maya assumes he's saying this because he thinks she can't do it. Henry clarifies that the fact that she can is what scares him. 
I don't get what his point is here. Like, legitimately, I, I don't get it. Henry then explains that he's 45 and alone because everyone he cares about was taken away by Fisk. Henry explains that Fisk threatened to kill him if he tried to get out of the game. Okay, so wait. You're telling me Fisk was the only thing keeping you from leaving his empire? So when the news came out that Fisk was killed, you didn't just use the opportunity to fall off the radar and ghost everyone? That's your excuse for wanting to help Maya? Because Fisk is back? You wouldn't have had to deal with Fisk if you used your fucking brain and left when you had the chance, you goofy ass kumquat. Maya criticizes Henry for being concerned about her now when he left her in New York. She specifically states that she was not okay. Again, your father took you to New York away from the rest of your family. Nobody left you in New York. And fuck all this noise, you were a grown ass woman when your father died. You expect someone to take care of you for the rest of your life? And even then, you weren't alone. Your uncle Fisk was taking care of you. And even then, you ghosted everyone after your father died. Remember? Remember this scene? Remember? To top it all off, it is absolutely disgusting that Maya listens to Henry explain his trauma and she flips it around and makes it about herself. This man has lost his brother and possibly even a lover since he says that he's 45 and alone and had his life threatened by one of the most powerful street level villains in the MCU. And when he explains the pain he went through, the pain he doesn't want you to go through, you make this all about yourself and how your grown ass needs someone to take care of you when you couldn't so much as pick up the fucking phone and ask for help from the people that care about you. Maya is the edgy teenager of the MCU who thinks they've had it tough when the actual superheroes have been through far worse and are less of a fucktard than she is. Tony Stark had his parents killed by a sleeper agent and the person who was supposed to be one of his closest allies lied to him about it, then allied himself with the killer. Natasha Romanoff was essentially sold into slavery and turned sterile in order to be the most effective killing machine the human race could create. She will never know what it is like to create life, only to take it. Peter Parker lost his uncle before his first appearance in the MCU, lost his mentor, lost his aunt, and had to wipe away the memories of everyone that cares about him and sever all connections to keep them safe, including his girlfriend. Before she went off the deep end, Wanda Maximoff's parents parents were shelled by a mortar. She then had to watch in agony for two whole ass days as a live bomb sat in front of her and her brother Pietro, wondering if it would go off and kill both of them. Later in her life, she watched Ultron gun her brother down, then she fell in love with Vision, had to kill him to save the universe, only to watch Thanos undo her sacrifice and kill her husband again. But Maya thinks she can act like a little bitch to everyone because her mom died in a car accident and her dad died partaking in some shit he had no business being in? I'm tired of characters, and actual people for that matter, pretending that any little bit of trauma gives them a carte blanche license to be a massive cunt to everyone. Fuck off. And then Henry apologizes because he was confused and scared. Motherfucker, it is not your fault your asshole niece didn't so much as add you on Snapchat. That is her fault. Why does this show have short-term memory that even Dory would find frustratingly short? Why does this show act like Maya's a victim in all this when she's just being a moody bitch who can't behave like a functioning member of society and converse with the people that care about her? Maya is in the fucking wrong here, guys. Get over yourselves. Why is this show trying its hardest to try and persuade us that Maya is right in any capacity in anything she has done in this show? The show is going to try and make this bag of ass a hero by the end of this story, by the way. I'm gonna start drinking now. So we head to the Haskell County Fairgrounds where preparations for the Choctaw Nation powwow are taking place. Obviously, the finale of the show is going to take place here. Chula approaches a sales table with a box and her friend asks Chula to hand her a bulb. When she does this, Chula gets a bunch of visions of Shafa and some other shit and at the same time, Maya does as well. This was when I noticed that nobody seems to be able to agree on the pronunciation of Chula's name. Some people say Chula, while others say Chula. I'll it to you too, Chula. New car, Chola? Hurry on out here, I have to get to work. Chola. 
It's the Krylar shit all over again. In a long time, Krylar. Lord, Krylar, no. Maya starts tweaking and stares at the ceiling. Henry is unable to communicate with her. Maya blacks out and Henry takes her to Chula's home. Chula and Maya meet eyes and I still have no fucking clue why I should give a shit that these two are finally in the same scene. As we've touched on before, the show has done a very bad job of explaining why there is any animosity between Chula and Maya on Chula's end. Henry says that something is going on and Chula can help Maya. Why does he think this? Don't know. Maya has this stank ass face because Henry took her to Chula. Yes, be mad at him because he took you to see someone he thought could help you after you had the spiritual equivalent of a fucking seizure. Maya approaches Chula and with the way the previous episodes depicted Chula, you'd think she was going to bite Maya's head off the moment she laid eyes on Maya, but instead they just stare at each other and again, because these characters haven't been explored before this scene, we have no idea what the fuck this moment is trying to say. What is this staring contest even supposed to mean? All we can gather from the connection between these two is that they haven't seen each other in decades. That's all we can pull from this scene. They haven't seen each other in a while, so watch these two empty characters stare at each other. At this point, I'm officially tired of seeing this character's fucking face. Maya only has three expressions, smug, flat expression, wide-eyed expression. Then there's those ugly ass faces she makes in every fight. Chula invites Maya in and this conversation has very little information that gets explained over the span of the next 6 minutes and 40 seconds in runtime. I'm going to sum this up for you in one sentence. Chula and Maya are both getting visions from the ancestors because something is about to happen. That's basically all this amounts to. But the smaller details make this scene go from bad to abysmal, so let's break it down, I guess. Chula explains that she had the same visions when she was giving birth to Maya's mother, Taloa, way back in the gap. There were a lot of complications and the doctors said, it's in God's hands. So Chula said, and I quote, Against the doctor's orders, my family took me out of the white hospital. We're still hating on white people, I see. It's not just the hospital, it's the white hospital. As if black, Latino, Asian, and Indian people don't use and work at those hospitals. Only white people do, apparently. And she says this as if her family is taking her to a different hospital, when all they're doing is taking her to a midwife in the middle of the fucking forest. That is quantifiably much worse. This baby is about to kill you and itself, and you think going out into the middle of the 100 acre woods and hanging out with Winnie the fucking Pooh is going to save you when modern medicine can't? The goofiest part is that there is no reason for them to be in the middle of the woods. Midwives operate in buildings like regular doctors and have some of the same tech regular doctors do. All this could have been avoided if she just swallowed her pride and got a c-section. You'd think, oh they're going to use some Native American magic to help the baby come out, but all they do is give her a twig to bite on as they sprinkle water on her belly as she nearly fucking dies. This clearly didn't do anything because we then see young Chula standing up next to a tree trying to shit her baby out. Why would you stand up while trying to give birth like this? If the baby comes out this way, they're going to fall out and hit their head on the ground and die instantly. What's funny about this shot is that the water falling on Chula is clearly not rain, but like someone spraying water from a hose or a something above. You can tell it's not rain because the midwife in the background that touches Chula is dry as a bag of uncooked rice. Look at her glasses. If it's supposed to be raining, why aren't her glasses wet? Chula explains that Taloa was a healer, someone who was meant to lift the pain of others. Oh, oh we will get to that shit soon enough. Chula then says that she didn't disown Maya, but disowned William. Maya explains that William told her that Chalua wanted to destroy their family and how she wanted nothing to do with them. Something we never saw on screen, by the way. The only thing we see William talk to young Maya about are dragons, how he wanted a different life for Maya, and how Taloa is dead. That's really it. To stonewall us on this crucial bit of context by cutting it out of the story and making it happen off screen does the story a disservice and tells us that the writers didn't think this part was important enough to include when this shit is incredibly important given how William is depicted as a good guy in a bad job rather than someone who would paint the situation with such heavy bias against Chula. 
At the 24 minute and 41 second mark of this episode, I jotted down this note. This shit is officially boring. I don't usually like to say something is boring as there are different stories for different paces, but this shit has a tendency to take forever to tell us nothing. It goes nowhere fast. Then Chula has a god-awful excuse for why she couldn't speak to Maya. She simply couldn't do it. See, this isn't like the other times where it is clear that Maya pushed people away. This is Chula just straight up saying that she couldn't look her granddaughter in the eye and be there for her for her own selfish reasons. She left Maya feeling like she hated her because she couldn't push past her own issues, and Maya was an only child. The feud between her father and Chula had nothing to do with her. This is ultra fucked when you take into consideration the scene in episode 2 where Chula meets with Henry and has this antagonistic and borderline snarling conversation with Henry about how she hopes Maya gets the fuck out of Dodge. You're giving me mixed messages here, show. Does Chula hate Maya or not? Holy fuck, look at this harsh editing. What the hell happened to her eyes that caused her to have tears in them so quickly? Chula then says that Maya is so much like her father. Again, we don't have a solid personality for Maya, so we just have to project the personalities of other characters onto her to compensate for the vapid writing in this show. Chula says that generations are echoing ah, ah, he said it, he said it. and reaching out to them because they need them right now. Maya says that she needed Chula when she was a child. This is literally the one time in the show where Maya could actually be viewed as the victim of emotional trauma. Because she's not dishing it out to everyone else. Maya leaves with Henry and Chula goes to her back room where she unveils what is going to be the hypothetical quote unquote glow up that all these Disney plus Marvel shows have in their final episode where the main character dons their new phase snore or phase slime superhero suit and then they do the thing where they play this loud ass pretentious song. This shit is childish amateur direction. You don't have the confidence that you nail the emotional beat so you just have some woman singing some sad sounding song loud as fuck as grandma here starts crying and you hope this is enough to get people to feel something. It's emotionally manipulative and lame as shit. During this montage there's a shot of Bonnie and it's just like why? Why did you show Bonnie when she literally hasn't done anything the entire episode? Did you think we would forget she existed because it's been over 30 minutes of runtime in this show and we haven't seen her? I mean, it's a valid assumption since Bonnie's only contribution to this show is getting captured. We see Biscuits looking at a scrapyard with his mechanic friend. Biscuits needs to find a part to fix Chula's truck. His friend references The Lion King, and Biscuits lampshades the reference to it by name dropping the movie. You know, I had a joke planned in one of my books that referred to the Lion King and now I have to remove it because of this shallow and unfunny joke. Biscuits then says what I'm assuming is supposed to be the overall theme of the show. Chola always says there's nothing too broke to fix. If you want it bad enough, don't throw it away. Aside from the obvious ADR, this theme gets laid on heavy as fuck out of nowhere near the end of the series. The idea is that Maya should work harder to fix her relationship with Chula, and she shouldn't throw it away. This is thrown down just as heavy as Teach you, just because something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved. Or Do you think maybe something should never be invented? No. Got a pre-existing juvenile foundational relationship. Statute 2705-3. You'd think this would be the end of the episode because of the cheesy, hokey music, but unfortunately, it keeps going. Maya goes to the casino and draws her 1911 as she closes in on Fisk. I have a bit to say on Maya's gun handling and combat maneuvers, but I'll save it until episode 5, where her skills and the director's gun knowledge are depicted at their worst. She holds her gun up at Fisk, and he turns around and says, I suspect you've come to kill me. No! Fisk explains that he loves Maya like a daughter. 
which is telling us more than we've been shown. The only real time we get anything that aligns with this statement is when he beat up the ice cream man at the beginning of the episode. Everything else is just Fisk being nice to move the plot forward. We never see that moment where Fisk meets Maya for the first time and that bond is formed. Fisk says that they only had each other, which is bullshit because Vanessa was also there for Fisk. Unless she got snapped, I can't find any information on that. Fisk gets upset when Maya says he's a monster. He retorts that Maya knew what she was a part of. Okay, look, how many times are we going to go over the same bullshit? You're a monster. It was all a lie. Get some new material, jerk off. Fisk does make a solid point. Maya killed a bunch of people on his order and she did it without question. But she has the audacity to act like she's on a moral high ground here when she isn't. The writers are already trying to convert Maya into a hero when it doesn't even make sense to. Maya says that Fisk doesn't care about her and that he only got the translator contact for her because he didn't care enough to learn ASL. I got quite a few comments that pointed out that Fisk would 100% learn ASL from Maya. Seems like the writers ignored the personality of this character in order to create a moment for Maya to criticize Fisk when the criticism wouldn't exist if Fisk was written the way he was supposed to be written. Fisk says that he failed Maya and the show proceeds to poach a plot point from a much better show in order to create an emotional payoff. Fisk explains his backstory from the Daredevil series. He grew up in an abusive home where his mother was physically abused by his father. One day he killed his father with a hammer to defend his mother. He apparently brought that very hammer with him to the casino, but one look at this fucking thing and you'll realize it's not the same hammer from the show. You stupid bitches decided to poach a poignant moment from a critically acclaimed show to try and boost your shitty show that nobody asked for only to get the fucking hammer wrong? It's pure fucking bullshit how you motherfuckers think that this saves your show from criticism and automatically gains critical acclaim because you grafted your tumor of a show onto the body of the beloved Greek athlete known as Daredevil. To give you an idea of how disrespectful this is, I stated in a comment on a community post that it's like if a guy you never met before shows up to one of your friend's gatherings, pretends they've been there the whole time, only he calls your oldest friend Gary when his name is actually Harry. It's not the same hammer though. My father felt stronger when he beat my mother until I got strong enough to stop him with that. Meaning this is supposed to be the hammer he killed his father with. This show should just save you and me the time and just go jump off a cliff. To make matters worse, this is a rushed, lazy, and ham-fisted way of introducing the backstory of Fisk in the penultimate episode so that the bullshit we're going to see in the last episode seems to make sense. The clunky re-establishment of Fisk's backstory is nakedly utilitarian. Fisk tells Maya to free herself by killing Fisk with the hammer. Of course she doesn't do it. I couldn't tell you why she makes this choice, but she sure does make this choice for some reason. We don't get an explanation of this at all. We dodge character moments in this show like they're contagious. Fisk tells her to meet him on his plane to go back to New York. Maya goes back home and recalls all of the events that led her here. She oddly remembers a scene from what I presume is Hawkeye, where Fisk uses ASL to tell Maya that he loves her. What? Why would you include this if the idea is to show that Fisk doesn't care about Maya because he didn't learn ASL, when he clearly did to some degree? Then she remembers her family and that one cousin who is weirdly lesbian coded. This causes her to leave Oklahoma and decline Fisk's offer. Fisk gets a call saying that Maya left after his guys tailed her. Remember that little detail. Fisk has a hissy fit and the episode ends. Seriously guys, this show is torture. You may have noticed something peculiar. This episode didn't have an action sequence. Now, in isolation, this isn't a problem. Some of the most interesting and memorable scenes in all of entertainment are scenes where the characters just talk. But that's the part that the writers of Echo forgot. They forgot to make the scenes interesting. So now, not only did we not get a hilariously inept action sequence, but we also got really dull and shallow conversations. Let's take a look at that prison scene that I keep referencing and discuss why it's so goddamn good. 
The scene starts with Fisk's lawyer handing an affidavit to Matt, stating that Fisk requested that he accommodate Matt's blindness by printing the document in Braille, even adding that Fisk is a very thoughtful man. But if you notice this blink and you miss it detail, the lawyer hands the document to Matt upside down, meaning he doesn't really give a shit about Matt's disability. Since most of the audience can't read Braille, the director slash writer have the lawyer explain what the document states so that the audience knows what Matt is signing. Basically, it's a document that is a gag order for Matt. In exchange for this interview, Matt is not allowed to speak to anyone about this conversation. His questions must be approved by the lawyer and failure to comply may result in monetary losses on Matt's side. There is a specific point that Matt is not allowed to come into contact with Fisk. Take note of that. Matt points out that this document contains a lot of rules and the lawyer states that the rules are what separate us from the animals. Hmm, interesting. We'll see how that comes into play later. Matt makes his way down the hallway and a fascinating thing occurs. This scene is breaking a rule, so to speak, of filmmaking, a term known as shoe leathering. The rule states that you're not supposed to show characters doing basic mundane shit like walking from room to room with the sole intent of depicting them in a transitional space. But the reason why this rule getting broken works is because it's not just to depict Matt making his way to Fisk's holding area. This is meant to ratchet up the tension. The context of this scene is that Matt is about to confront his arch nemesis, not as Daredevil but as Matt Murdock. He is forced to face Fisk as his civilian identity in a non-violent way. He can't give away his identity by simply whooping Fisk's ass Daredevil style. The tense background music and thumping heart sound effect really add to the scene and shows the director's intent. When Matt makes it to the holding area, the lawyer tells him that he can't take the cane in there. Matt's one weapon as a civilian is being taken away from him. He is basically defenseless against this Goliath of a man. The lawyer guides Matt to the table, sets up his recorder, and tells Matt that he has 10 minutes for questions. This is where the fun begins. Fisk asks Matt if he remembers the time they met before Matt pursued legal action against him. Matt shows that he's about business and cuts off Fisk, saying that he must be aware of the shooting at the courthouse. Without missing a beat or being flustered by Matt's curtness, Fisk simply says that it was unfortunate but doesn't explain why Matt came to Fisk. It becomes very clear that Matt is not happy with Fisk as he sits rigidly in his seat as he accuses Fisk of arranging the Punisher's escape. Fisk says that he and Frank Castle are on two totally different paths and Matt explains that this is precisely why Fisk did it. The leap in logic it would require to put those two pieces together provides the perfect alibi. Fisk mocks Matt and asks if he can even prove this in the court of law. Matt somewhat acknowledges that this is a stretch and is going to be hard as hell to prove because he doesn't answer Fisk's question, simply electing to move to the next question. Or, if you want to interpret it another way, Matt knows he has limited time and he's not going to waste it arguing over petty details. Matt asks Fisk where Frank Castle is and Fisk simply answers, not here. This is such a coy response because it kind of implies that he does know where Frank is, but it legally protects him because his answer is broadly correct. Matt asks if Fisk has anything to do with Frank's release and Fisk's lawyer hops in quickly to say that Fisk doesn't have to answer that question, only for Fisk to answer it anyway with a denial, showing how confident he is in this situation. He is so sure that he has this under control that he goes against his legal counsel. The lawyer advises Matt that he is running out of time. There is a profile shot of Matt licking his lips but remaining silent. The pressure is on, but he has an idea that seems to make him uncomfortable. The fact that he remained silent after being told that he's running out of time to ask questions implies this. Matt lets Fisk talk. All of it is going in one ear and out the other as he seems to let the plan formulate in his mind. Fisk seems to implicitly gloat that Matt has reached a dead end by telling him that he has no answers as he pretends to be someone who isn't a murderer and a crime lord. Fisk says that the fate of New York City is out of his hands for once and Matt has an enraged outburst, saying it's bullshit. There is a suffocating pause as we watch the smile on Fisk's face fade away, possibly because he realizes that Matt knows something he shouldn't. A man getting this worked up over this conversation knows something. 
Fisk realizes that something is off and subtly expresses this by saying that he doesn't know what Matt expects from him and telling him that this interview is over. Matt seems to put his head down in defeat as Fisk ends the interview prematurely. As soon as Fisk's lawyer turns off the recorder, Matt drops a bomb on Fisk. Vanessa. You can practically feel the aura of the room shift. We get a shot of Fisk's expression. He's beginning to realize that his assumption was correct. Matt proceeds to explain how he is very aware of who Vanessa is and what her current whereabouts are. Fisk tells his lawyer to leave them as his expression darkens. Seemingly knowing what this means, the lawyer takes the recorder with him. Matt threatens to ensure Vanessa and Fisk can never live together again. As Matt explains his threat in detail, Fisk slides his cuffed hands off the table. As Matt continues, Fisk goes through a variety of different expressions. He changes from a fake smirk to a dead expression to an aggressive grimace. There's some dramatic irony here. As Matt doesn't know how severe of a mistake he's made, but the audience does. That's why the background music isn't as triumphant as you would think for a scene where the hero gets the upper hand on the villain. Matt finishes his threat with a character assessment of Fisk that cements the idea that Matt is someone Fisk should not be taking lightly. Matt understands that Fisk could leave the country and be with Vanessa once his sentence is over, but he cares deeply about having New York City under his control. Fisk is not a man known for compromise. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. So to hear Matt threaten to make that impossible, Fisk will not have that. Speak her name again! Go ahead! Yes, the son of a boxer! Neat detail that Fisk doesn't assume anything crazy after Matt punches him because he knows Matt's father was a boxer. Matt gets his assumption confirmed that Fisk is more involved than he let on during the recorded interview. The flips in power in such a short amount of time is insane. The scene went from Fisk holding all the cards to Matt gaining an advantage to Fisk revealing his true power as Matt gains a Pyrrhic victory. Fisk tells him that he will dismantle the lives of both Matt and Foggy for putting him in prison. Matt tries his best to shift blame to himself without directly admitting that he is Daredevil by saying that he put Fisk in jail. And Fisk says one of the coldest lines I've heard in a while. I bet you're here. Not Nelson. No. I did it. The two of you took the laurels. You'll both take the blame. Then Fisk says that he's thought about a lot of things while locked up in this prison, and he says that he can't wait to look down on New York City with the woman he loves, implying that he deals with so much bureaucracy and obfuscation just to make his success more satisfying in the end, because it will have been absolute. Matt leaves the room, stumbling as he tries to get to his feet. Fisk taunts him by saying they should do this again another time. Chances are he hasn't had anyone pose a threat to him like this in a long time. Daredevil was a physical threat, but Matt is a legal threat. The scene ends with the lawyer attempting to assist Matt out of the room, only for Matt to shove him away out of disgust for being part of the corrupt system. He also must be extra frustrated because he may have doubts about his own morals since there seems to be a nugget of truth in what Frank Castle said to him on that rooftop. You run around this city like it's your damn shooting gallery. Yeah, what do you, you do? You... What do you do? You act like it's a playground. You beat up the bullies with your fists, you throw them in jail, everybody calls you a hero, right? And then a month, a week, a day later, they're back on the streets doing the yeah. same goddamn so, thing. So you just... I think you're wrong. Which part? All of it. I think there's no good in the field that I put down. That's what I think. And how do you know? I just know. Look around, man. This city, it stinks. It's a sewer. It stinks and it smells like shit. And I can't get the stink out of my nose. I think that this world, it needs men that are willing to make the hard call. That's what I think. I think you and me are the shit, the Frank, same. you know it. Only I do the one thing that you can't. You hit them and they get back up. I hit them and they stay down. Each interaction, each line, each quirk and tick that the characters do has layers to it. It's not just two talking heads speaking back and forth like it is an echo. There are so many things you can pull out of several scenes in the Daredevil show that only deepen your understanding and appreciation of the characters. While the conversations in Echo are a five course meal consisting of only two items, Jack and Shit. Unfortunately, we have to return to the show of the hour. The final episode of Echo starts with a recap that has scenes from the very first episode and Hawkeye. 
This show has so little going on that it has to remind you of the events of episode 1 at the beginning of every single episode. I'm, I'm actually going to dissect how bad this recap is for a second. They show biscuits in the truck during the train heist from episode 2 and the succeeding damage it sustained, but they don't remind you of how or why the truck is damaged. Next, they show a clip of Bonnie standing next to a guy as Henry says he won't bring a war to the people he loves. This makes sense with the appropriate context in mind, but as a utility to remind the audience of what happened, this shit is atrocious. Who is the guy standing next to Bonnie? Why is he standing next to her as she looks uncomfortable? Remind the audience, please. Then they show the scene of Fisk showing Maya the hammer, but they don't explain that he told her to kill him with it. Then the following scenes are just things happening. None of it is part of the actual plot of the show. They show Chula working on Maya's hero costume or whatever. They show the Choctaw powwow sign. They show the scene of Chula saying that generations are echoing, but they don't even remind you of what the fuck that even means. Then Shafa appears and is just standing there looking like a weird alien lady with zero context. A bunch of women flash on screen. No, it's not the fun kind of flashing either, it's just their faces. To someone who walked away for a week or two and is just coming back, these faces mean fuck all. The only part of the recap that actually reminds you of what happened in a way that helps you recall what occurred is when they have Fisk say that Maya can have her empire if she goes with him, only to cut to the part where he gets told that Maya left the city. That works because it recaps a specific plot point and the consequences of said plot point. The episode finally starts with a shot of the CGI Biskinik minding its own business as Maya the little shit creeps on it from the bushes. What comes next is absolutely wild. Maya aims a slingshot at this innocent little bird and absolutely beams it with a rock. What the fuck is wrong with you? Maya takes her victim to her mother and lies to her, saying she found the bird like this. Her mom immediately calls her out on this and knows that the bird didn't just hurt itself. This probably means that this isn't the first time Maya has injured an animal for no fucking reason. Well, actually, the reason Maya gives for hurting the bird is that she wanted to see if she could hit it. Bitch, practice shooting your slingshot on empty bottles or something, not living things that are minding their own fucking business. You deadass could have killed this bird. Birds are very easy to kill. They can be so traumatized by their injuries that they go into shock and die. I say all this to establish that the writers thought we wouldn't find it fucking disgusting to have Maya nearly kill a bird for no good reason. But to jump ahead a bit, none of what I explained really even matters because Taloa has Choctaw spirit powers or whatever. On a completely different note, did you guys also know that cruelty towards animals is a sign of psychopathy in children? But seriously, on a meta level, who the hell thought this would be a good idea? They really said, let's take this character that we want people to relate to and possibly even turn into a hero by the end of this show and make them abuse animals. This looks really bad because we are led to believe that Maya's dark turn came about when her father died. But this and the flashback from the previous episode show us that she was always a little piece of shit that terrorized everyone and everything. This recontextualizes everything we experienced before this scene. Maya is not behaving this way because she's traumatized. Maya is behaving this way because she is just a festering subhuman wart of a living being that wasted the gift of life. Damn, I'm, I'm kind of realizing I went kind of hard right there. <laughs> There's this awkward part where Taloa tells Maya that they don't harm living things, but it's literally just subtitles. There's no shot of Taloa using ASL to explain this. I'm literally showing you the shot where Taloa explains this, and it's just a shot of the Biskinik writhing in pain. You wouldn't know that this was the shot unless I told you. Taloa then explains the bond the Biskinik and the Choctaw had where they worked together to leave messages on trees. This is the writers trying to diegetically explain to the audience that the Biskinik is a form of visual and internal foreshadowing, but it's lazy as hell. There's nothing clever about having a shot of this bird appear as a way of telling the audience and characters that bad things are about to happen. It gets even worse later in this episode, by the way. You know what was some real good foreshadowing? The twist in Joker that Sophie was never actually with Arthur. 
After the very awkward interaction in the elevator, Arthur follows Sophie to work the next day, but backs out right before he's about to see her at her job. Sometime later, Sophie appears at his door and asks if Arthur was following her, and he admits that he was. Notice what she says here. I was hoping you'd come in and rob the place. I have a gun. I'll come by tomorrow. The thing about this is that if you were paying attention, you'll realize very quickly that Sophie never asked for or knew Arthur's name. So how did she know it? It's a hint that at least this scene is a pyrocynical video and is all in the head. Also, the scene plays out very oddly once you understand the larger context. Did you ever notice that Arthur is actually capable of forming a joke here? He's not laughing uncontrollably even though this is a rather uncomfortable situation. Arthur seems strangely well adjusted in this scene for someone who struggles in every other social situation. The only other time Arthur is capable of forming anything that resembles a joke is at the end of the film where his inner insanity claws its way out to the surface. Foreshadowing is supposed to be subtle, not a big fuck off sign that says something bad is about to happen bro. Anyways, Maya asks if they can fix the bird and Taloa... Well, Taloa... So not only did Shafa's powers give you super strength, Tuklo's powers give you hyper accuracy, and whatever Loak had, now, now you can heal living beings? would have been useful to one of Shafa's descendants during, oh, I don't know, a certain event that occurred from 1830 to 1850? And wait a minute, this means Maya had previously seen her mother use her glowing hand powers before, and she never mentioned this ever again? As she got older, she never wondered if she had the same power as her mother? This is some shit that would stick with you for life! Oh, trust me, it gets much worse. So we get another recap of the car crash that killed Taloa. My guy, we have seen this car crash no less than four times. We don't need to see this anymore. Did they not know how to end the flashback so they just stuck this scene at the end? Here's an idea, just, just make this a daydream Maya had while riding. That way we can get a solid transition from the past to the present. So the intro sequence starts and I'm just now realizing that it is a minute and a half long. Even Justice League Unlimited, which has an intro sequence that feels like it overstays its welcome a little bit, is a fraction of the length of Echo's intro. This show really does not know how to use its time efficiently. The episode begins and Chula visits Scully's pawn shop to ask for her old sewing machine that she pawned off. Scully still has it because he knew she'd be back for it. Scully gives it back to her for free with the stipulation that she comes back to visit him occasionally, alluding to his feelings for Chula still being alive and a possible rekindling of their relationship. But this is the one and only scene where Chula and Scully share this type of chemistry, so this setup has no payoff. Or we can guess where the payoff actually is. Honestly, Marvel has conditioned me to think every sincere moment is going to get ruined by a joke or something. I half expected Chula to say something snarky when Scully places his hand on hers. It's kind of weird that we get a quiet moment of sincerity. That was Scully's last scene, by the way. You think I'm joking? Watch. We see Chula head to her job at the post office and this rude ass kid knocks the letters out of her hands and doesn't offer to help. Well, we needed her to be a little brat with no manners because Fisk needs to be the person who helps Chula pick up the letters. This scene is proof that these motherfuckers understand dramatic irony and tension. Because Chula doesn't know that Fisk is dangerous, but the audience does. Why they fail to establish tension in every episode before this one is one of life's many questions. This scene would actually work if this show didn't make Fisk a complete cuck. But Fisk points out that Chula's necklace says I love you in ASL, which means he knows some ASL which creates this weird half-assery of Fisk knowing a little bit of ASL, but not enough to be conversational. Based on the Daredevil show, Fisk is not one to be half-assing anything. But anyways, it's clear Fisk is going to kidnap Chula, so we're going to skip to the next scene. Maya is taking a rest stop at a travel store to get something to eat. 
Maya decides to take out the contact that allows her to translate speech to ASL. You threw it away! Don't, don't throw it away, you fucking watermelon. You can use it to understand what people are saying to you. As we saw in the last episode, there is no tracker in it because Fisk had his guys tailing Maya out of the city. Regardless of who it came from, this device would be an incredibly useful thing to have. It was a useful tool that you threw away solely because Fisk man no good. It's like when Kylo Ren threw his very useful lightsaber into the ocean solely because it was red, only to end up needing one when he infiltrated Exegol and got bodied by the Knights of Ren. Guilt by association is such a dumb fucking concept, dude. We cut back to the powwow and wait a minute, go back for a second, what the hell was that? What was the point of that scene? The only thing we gathered from that scene was that Maya threw away the contact lens. There was no reason to include it and, in my opinion, the removal of that scene would have made the story better. We don't need a scene that tells us Maya stopped for a bite to eat. Just show us Maya eating the next time we see her. And keep the fucking contact lens. Continuing on, we see Biscuits on parking lot duty and waves down an RV. Inside, we see Zane is driving and Biscuits tells him this is vendor parking. But Zane doesn't give a shit and he parks there anyway. Because Biscuits doesn't have a spine, he just lets it happen. He doesn't call the cops, he doesn't call for help, Just he just lets it happen. Biscuits mentions to the best character in the show, Billy Jack, that Chula should have been at the fair by now. We check back with Maya and she's eating food. How'd she order the food? Did she point at the menu? If she did, why didn't the little psychopath Maya do that with the ice cream man? Hmm. Anyway, she receives a text from Biscuits asking her where she is. Maya predictably ignores the text message. What? Mm. Why does anyone like this bitch? Why is she being an ass to Biscuits when he has literally done nothing wrong to her? She looks out the window and what do you know, the Biscuitnik shows up. She receives another text from Biscuits saying that Chula and Bonnie were supposed to be at the powwow an hour ago. Maya jumps to her feet, gets back on her slow ass Royal Enfield, and heads back to Tamaha. Now my lovely viewers, riddle me this. Why should I believe Maya would legitimately go back to Tamaha to save her family? She has shown time after time after goddamn time that she doesn't give a shit about anyone but herself. She constantly ignores text messages from these people, abuses and uses them, stomps all over them when they express their own trauma while constantly weaponizing her own trauma to make herself out as the victim. Why would I believe Maya would go back to that town to save Bonnie and Chula? She couldn't even keep her promise to Bonnie to explain what happened at the skating rink. Maya rushes to Chula's home and draws her firearm as she waddles to the door like she's holding in a girthy shit. Now here we are, the firearm and weapons handling portion of the review. You thought the motorcycle shit was bad? Wait till you get a load of this. So first off, let's jump back to episode 1. Take a look at that 1911 when Maya sees biscuits outside the house. As this commenter pointed out, the 1911 is a single action firearm, meaning this hammer near the rear of the gun needs to be pulled down in order to fire it. Since I actually own a 1911, I'll let live action me demonstrate this. Hello, my friends on the internet. Do not ask why I'm wearing a hat inside. My hair is a mess and I don't want you to see it. I explained it to you already, never mind. So what we have here is a 1911. It is cleared, I have cleared it. There's nothing in here. There's no rounds in here. As a matter of fact, YouTube, if you're watching, this is Airsoft, I promise to you. What you have here is the hammer. This little thing right here is the hammer, right? And if the hammer's not pulled back, watch this. Yeah, it's not firing. You're not hearing that click, which would be the firing pin hitting the back of the, the cartridge. So what you have to do is you have to pull the hammer back, right? Hammer's pulled back now. Now listen. See how it fired? See, as long as that hammer is not pulled back, this gun can't fire. So, back to uh, cartoon avatar me. What this means is that if Maya really did have to use her gun, then it would basically be useless unless she pulled the hammer back. And as I've shown in this heart rate chart in part 1, when your heart rate increases to approximately 115 beats per minute, you will lose the ability to use fine motor skills. 
which include using scissors, tying shoes, typing on a keyboard, and pulling the hammer of a 1911 back with your thumb. If Maya had to use this pistol in a fight, she would be screwed because she probably wouldn't be able to cock the hammer back due to stress. The wildest part is that this is not a one-off mistake. Every time Maya pulls out her 1911 throughout the show, the hammer is not pulled back. When she draws it in the casino before meeting Fisk, in this scene we're about to talk about, and in the climax of the episode, to jump ahead a bit, she's literally got her gun aimed at Fisk because she kidnapped Bonnie and Chula, but the hammer isn't pulled back so it's essentially a gun with a dead trigger. Now, you may have noticed that Maya's original gun, the Beretta 80X Cheetah, didn't have its hammer pulled back but it could still be fired. Well, that's because that pistol is a double action, single action firearm, meaning you can either cock the hammer back yourself or leave it uncocked and it can cock itself when you pull the trigger. This allows the gun to always be ready to fire as long as the safety is off. That's another reason why I'm confused as to why Maya traded that gun out for a 1911. The Beretta was even better than I sold it in the first part of this review. Now let's talk about how this show depicts silencers. This isn't something exclusive to Echo, but I want to talk about it because it's such a common misconception that I myself made this mistake in my first book. Listen to this. Yeah, handgun silencers are not this quiet. How loud is a silenced pistol in real life? Since I don't own a silencer, I'll have this guy show you. I hate those damn flies. This is why I honestly prefer to call them suppressors instead of silencers. While they do make your gun quieter, it is still very loud. Some decibel charts depict suppressed handgun fire as being louder than a jackhammer. The only way to get that movie quiet silencer sound is to suppress a gun chambered in 22 long rifle and use subsonic ammo that doesn't break the sound barrier. Which is not really the ideal caliber for a hyper edgy assassin criminal going up against the likes of Hawkeye, Kate Bishop, and Daredevil. To jump ahead a bit, Henry takes this shot at Zane with a suppressed Glock and, while it is possible to make this shot at this distance, everyone at the powwow is going to hear it. You can mitigate this a bit with subsonic ammo, but we're still talking about creating a small explosion and ejecting a metal object at someone. No matter what you do, that shit is going to be loud. Not to mention that this is how loud the sound of a pistol slide moving back and forth is. Now, let's talk about Maya's room clearing technique. It's fucking terrible. Now, I'm no combat expert or anything, but I was taught how to clear rooms by my friend in the Navy, who's also a firearms instructor and a GM too. First thing he told me is that clearing a house by yourself is very slow and very difficult. You may have possible targets roaming around the house and they can get behind you if your home has any loops in it. Next, he taught me to never stand directly in the middle of the doorway. That's exactly where attackers are expecting you to appear. You'll get blasted immediately. Next, you're supposed to do what is called slicing the pie, a tactic that allows you to safely engage targets without putting your entire body at risk. What you do is that you start parallel to the door, then you orbit around the entrance slowly as you aim, looking for arms and legs because this confirms a threat. Once you confirm a threat, you engage. Then once you've confirmed a room is clear, you move in and stay away from the center of the room and repeat the process until the house has been cleared. Seems simple, right? Well, guess what? I'm going to play a hit marker sound every time Maya could have been shot if someone was in this house. That's seven times Maya could have been blasted by some guy camping in a corner in one of the rooms. How is a hyper-competent criminal assassin so ignorant compared to a complete fucking schlemiel like me whose only combat experience is armed private security? Everything I just explained is all easily accessible information that can be taught to someone via YouTube. It's a miracle Maya survived this long when her room clearing technique is so shit. 
And what was up with that stiff-ass Mass Effect 1 run with her gun up, waving it around everywhere? She should be keeping her handgun close to her body so she has better control of her firearm, and so nobody grabs it out of her hands before she sees them from around a corner. One of the rules of safe firearms handling is never point your gun at anything you do not intend to destroy. What if Chula was perfectly fine and Maya accidentally blasted her because she oopsed all over the trigger because she was startled? Somebody's poke knee is dead as a doorknob. She's legit just waving her pistol around like a buffoon. This shit would get you kicked out of a gun range, but it's perfectly acceptable in a Hollywood production. And guess what again? Later in the episode, she's going to enter a very large barn that could have a bunch of bad guys in it the exact same way she does here. And what's even better is that they could have had way better weapons than she did. Spoiler alert, Fisk's guys are armed with AR-18s, no that is not a mistake, Remington 870 pump action shotguns, MP5 submachine guns, and one of them has a fucking RPG. Finally, we're moving on to the plot. Maya clears the house and reaches Chula's storage area where she sees... her mother? Oh boy. So basically, Taloa is a spiritual apparition and she says that Maya has really been hurting. Fuck off, we don't need another boohoo woe is me session for this bitch. We've had like three of them in the five episodes we've been subjugated to. Taloa, as a fucking ghost, uses her healing powers on Maya's chest and they have a conversation in the wreckage of the crash that killed Taloa. Taloa says that Maya is not alone. This bitch has never been alone. She had Bonnie, Henry, Biscuit, Scully, and even Wilson fucking Fisk helping her pro bono. Ah, but you see, Taloa is referring to their ancestors, Tuklo, Loak, Shafa, and even Taloa herself. They are all a part of Maya because they echo Oh, that's why they call it that. through her. It's funny how this is supposed to be a very emotional and powerful scene and Maya just has the same old ashy ass expression she always has. No tears, no pain to smile as she cries because her dead mother is speaking to her for the first time in over 15 years. Just whatever this expression is supposed to be. In what has to be one of the most shallow lessons I've seen in one of these shows, Taloa just tells Maya that it's time for the pain to go away. Fuck you. Emotional trauma and pain is not something that just goes away. It takes time, introspection, and perseverance to heal from trauma. And because the writers are fucking clown people, Taloa says that instead of the tangible and legitimate means of dealing with trauma, Maya's magic space ancestors, who are very special women, mind you, can't forget that part, will help her heal. Uh, I guess, I guess fucking like, you know, if you don't have Native American super ancestors, you're just fucked then, huh? This shit is insulting, dude. She says that Shafa and her descendants were the protectors of the Choctaw people. Again, don't ask them what they were doing during 1830 to 1850. Please do not ask them. I don't think we can handle the answer. Now it's Maya's turn, apparently. Maya says that she only brings danger. You're goddamn right you do, with your selfish ass. What Taloa says next floored me. She tells Maya to fight for their family, and she tells her to use her gifts. The first one being strategy as they show a picture of Loak, the lady who showed no actual strategy and couldn't even fucking run correctly. Is that what we're supposed to glean from Loak's flashback? She was a strategist by jumping over the other players? This shit is whack. Then they show Tuklo and say that she was cunning. She stood on a boulder and shot people when her dumbass should have died. There was nothing cunning about what she did. Then they show Shafa and say that she had ferocity. Bitch, where? She drank a galaxy, destroyed her tribe's home, then told everyone to follow her. Where is the ferocity? Shafa is the worst offender here because we literally didn't see her do anything after the cave collapsed. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I'm doing my part. I didn't do fucking shit. And Taloa includes herself under the gift of love, the only one I can't really disagree with. Yet. She says all four of those gifts are infused into Maya's superhero costume that Chula was working on. They reveal it and it looks like shit, honestly. It looks like a bootleg copyright safe Wakandan outfit. Taloa says that she will always love Maya, then she disappears.
So where the fuck have you been for the past 15 years, Taloa? <laughs> oh, get a load of this shit. Taloa had the ability to return as a ghost and help heal Maya's trauma at any time and chose now to show her face. After Maya was taken away from her family, after William died, after Fisk swept Maya up into a criminal empire, after Maya decided to butt heads with said criminal empire, Taloa watched her daughter suffer for 15 years and did nothing. And when she finally shows her mug, she does something that could have steered Maya off this path of self-destruction. It's just like Force Ghost Yoda zapping a tree with Force Lightning. These hack writers keep repeating the same stupid mistakes in an Ouroboros of dog shit. Then the show decides to assault my ears with this. I am at my wit's end with this obnoxious ass music, dude. So the finale is upon us. Fucking finally. The powwow is on as there is a quiet before the storm. Zane and the rest of Fisk's men set up and they are armed to the teeth with an assortment of weapons. These dudes look like they are ready to pull off a no Russian. I wonder how Maya is going to get out of this with her little 7 round 1911. One of Fisk's guys says that they're on the lookout for Maya and she's heavily armed. That's, that, that's just factually incorrect, but whatever. Because these shows and movies have to be showcases for people's cultures and can't just be entertainment, we get this whole sequence of Native American performances. And look who's in the middle of the fucking performance clear as day. Maya fuckface Lopez. How does anyone not see her stupid ass? The worst part is that she's not even on beat with the rest of the performers. She should be sticking out like a sore thumb. Also, the audio went out again and I have no clue why. We're getting all these close-ups of random shit, but there's no significance behind it. It's like the director believes that close-ups are important, but doesn't know why. I think it's because we're supposed to realize that her heartbeat is in sync with the drum, but I was only able to come to that conclusion with the SDH subtitles on, not the forced subtitles. Zane gets on top of his RV as Maya spots the stupid Biskinik on the barn's light signaling to her that this is where she needs to be. This is lame as fuck because the answer to her problem is just given to her instead of her working for it. But moving on. Henry arrives and calls Biscuits. Question. How does Henry know something is wrong here? Who briefed him? And why does Biscuits believe something is about to happen when last we saw of him he was just annoyed by Zane not listening to him? And since when were Biscuits and Henry in communication with each other? These two have never spoken to each other the entire show. Peep what Biscuit says here. Not today, Naholos. Not today. Now, what does Naholos mean? Well, Naholos loosely translates to Caucasians or whites. Don't worry about it. Referring to people solely by their race is okay when they're white. Didn't you hear? Casual prejudice is in vogue, guys. It totally wouldn't be weird if he referred to a group of black or Latino people in this way. Anyways, Henry asks Biscuits if he has a gun or a weapon. Biscuits says that he has something even better? What the hell is better in this situation than a gun? Here comes the only part of the show I actually like and it's so small. Watch. I get so tired of seeing media depict normal people as helpless nobodies who are never prepared for the worst. In America, there are more guns than people and it frustrates me to see shit like the first Last of Us game where they pretend that nobody outside of the military owns the good shit when I've got this sitting in my closet and many other Americans do too. Not to mention the amount of people who conceal carry, let alone the states that allow you to carry without a permit. Outside of like five states, we Americans stay strapped. And to finally see a character be realistically armed and not treated like a goofball caricature of gun owners depicting us the way Hollywood views us is genuinely refreshing. Henry is the prime example of what your average gun owner is like and how they behave. Unassuming, normal, minding their own business. I'm genuinely shocked Disney allowed this because if James Cameron's words are any indication, it seems like Hollywood has a certain distaste for firearms for some reason. 
despite making trillions of dollars off of guns and violence over the past 100 years. Mind you, I'm not making an argument for representation here. I'm making an argument for realism. This is not a matter of pandering to my beliefs. It's a matter of depicting American culture and lifestyles realistically. But where was this gun when Rental Guy captured him? Wait, you keep the chamber empty? If you say so. Biscuits continues his racist tirade as Maya enters the barn. She does her terrible room clearing technique with the hammer of her 1911 not pulled back as she moves through a dark barn that could have God knows what in it. At the end of the barn, Fisk walks in and his piano motif plays. It's funny because I expect the sister location menu theme to start playing every time I hear it. But the scene cuts to the event so we can get some more of that representation before we cut back to Maya in the barn. Marvel is officially the studio where editing goes to die. What was the point of that? That added nothing to the overall story. Fisk reveals that he has indeed captured Bonnie and Chula. Maya begins trembling as if we're supposed to believe she's scared that something bad will happen to them when she has never displayed any genuine care for either of them, let alone any emotion that wasn't completely manufactured by the script's demands. If anything, I'm inclined to believe she hates both of them as she punched Bonnie in the face and abandoned her after she promised to explain everything, and she had an argument with Chula about her abandoning Maya when she was a child. One of Fisk's guys takes Maya's gun from her. Not like she was going to be able to use it anyways. And Fisk begins talking to Maya as Bonnie translates for him in ASL. Hey guys, did, did you forget that Fisk gave her a translator and he doesn't know that she threw it away? You're doing it again. You're giving information to the characters that they shouldn't have. They even brought Bonnie up closer to Fisk while keeping Shula in the back because they knew Maya would need a translator. You made the same mistake in the Marvels. Wouldn't it have been a neat character moment if Fisk tries to talk to Maya but she tells him that she threw away his translator and this causes Fisk to realize that she genuinely doesn't care about him? He could express frustration because he has given her everything, even advanced technology that shouldn't exist, but she keeps squandering everything. He could then point out that this family that she cares about so much abandoned her and never did a single thing for her, but she's willing to spit in his face to save them. Hey, let's even put a band-aid on one of these issues and have Fisk say that he needed a translator because he's actually learning ASL and wasn't ready to have a full conversation with it yet. Marvel, please hire me as your script doctor. This, this shit is embarrassing. I will save you. I promise. Also, interesting that Fisk didn't pick Chula to translate for him. He instead chose Bonnie, the character we have never seen Fisk interact with. He knew Chula knew ASL, but we never established that he knew that Bonnie did. I wonder why the writers would have Bonnie do this instead. Let's take a moment and pretend that Bonnie is Maya's love interest. This scene would make a bit more sense if Fisk knew that Maya had feelings for Bonnie. Fisk would make Maya's love interest sign to her in ASL that he's going to kill everyone she cares about. Seems more dastardly that way, right? My theory holds strong. Bonnie was probably supposed to be Maya's love interest. We need to see an expose on the production of this eldritch horror. This scene is legitimately the only scene in the show where the lack of sound effects and speech actually works in its favor. More on that in a bit. Fisk whines about being betrayed and Maya says who betrayed who first. There's still no answer for why Fisk had William killed. Outside, Zane sits atop his RV watching the powwow as he waits for a signal. Henry, in public mind you, is walking around with his Glock in his hand. Alright my guy, let's not incite a panic now. Of course because the actor is probably on a green screen or something, they never even thought about how civilians would react to a man with a firearm at a crowded event. Nope, never crossed their minds. Henry spots Zane sitting on the roof of his RV and makes his way over. Fisk continues to suffer from simp seethe for Maya as he says that Maya brought this upon herself. Maya goes on to explain that her family has nothing to do with this, but for no discernible reason, she tells him what Taloa told her, that she is a part of them and they are a part of her. Oh my god, time and place, and you did it at my birthday dinner. What, what are you guys doing? 
Mega oof, my dude. Are you guys so proud of this theme that you had to have Maya recite this word for word to the bad guy? It's implemented in such a cringe and clunky way that it doesn't even look like Maya believes the shit she's saying. It's a massive non sequitur. It comes out of nowhere. She says that she is their legacy, not Fisk's. Fisk basically orders a mass shooting on the powwow and have Chula and Bonnie killed. He also admits that he killed William, again. Why the fuck did you do that? We still have no clue why he did that. That is your job as a writer. Use that noggin of yours to cook up an interesting reason why Fisk had William killed. It's fucking lazy to kill off a character to create drama, but not give an explanation for why that character had to die. Quick tangent. This is something I was constantly grilled on with a project I had in film school, where I had a character get killed off in a short film, and my professor harped on it. Why did this character have to die? What is the narrative significance of his death? If a character's death adds nothing to the story other than to create drama, then it's not worth including. No, this writing knowledge did not come naturally. I, too, was once a Padawan that had to learn. William's death acts as nothing more than an excuse for Maya to be a brat to everyone. There is no other significance. There's no character reason for why Fisk killed William either. There's no plot reason. He just dies. Outside, Zane receives the order to begin the operation. He opens his Yeti brand cooler and pulls out a rocket-powered grenade that's nestled next to some Capri Sun and Mellow Yellow. Guys, again, tone. Is this supposed to be serious or not? He's a quirky bad guy who drinks juice and he waits to slaughter a bunch of innocent people. Isn't he just the kookiest? Fuck this. Not every show, video game, or movie has to be Borderlands or Deadpool. Why is Zane such a cartoon character villain in this show that is supposed to be, say it with me now, dark and grounded? Also, hell of a product placement, that is. Your cooler is used by the white supremacist coded villain to hide a weapon meant to cause a mass casualty event. If I was Yeti, I'd sue. And now, the only time the lack of audio actually adds something. We cut back to Fisk and he yells something at Maya, but in complete shock, Bonnie fails to translate it and only looks at Maya in horror. She was so shocked by what Fisk said that she froze. This leads to one of Fisk's men blindsiding Maya and whacking her across the face. Now see, this is cool because it adds to the anxiety the audience should have by having everyone on edge to see what happens next. Bonnie was our one way to figure out what Fisk had in store, and she was so disturbed by what she heard that she couldn't act. What did she hear that made her so perturbed? This is diminished by the fact that a guy standing right next to Maya punched her and she didn't see it coming. I'm going to slow it down for you. She literally looked at the guy that approached her and thwacked her across the face. And now the sound is back. It was fun while it lasted. This show has this tendency to emphasize the blood as an excuse to market this as TVMA. There's this goopy sound that plays as CGI blood falls from Maya's mouth. This looks like something they added in post as something they never intended on adding, but did so to try and save this train wreck by pulling a Shadow the Hedgehog and adding some gimmicky edge in order to drum up buzz. Maya has her convenient visions, takes off her jacket, and she stands up and has her girl power moment with her ancestors. And here comes the most insane part. Ignoring the cringe, Maya shared her powers with Bonnie and Chula. Ah! We're doing this? We're doing this again? First in Love and Thunder, now this? Here we go, I'm about to lose it. Alright, so let me get this straight. Maya saw her mom heal a bird with superpowers, never questioned it as an adult, gets surprised when her hands glow the same way her mom's did and is confused by it, never tries to activate these powers in her own controlled environment so she has a better understanding of them like Peter Parker did in the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man, never asked Chula or Scully about it, and now, without any training, can fucking share powers? And wait, Chula and Bonnie are also descendants of Shafa. Where are their powers? Do they not get any? 
How do the powers decide who is worthy of having them? Are there other descendants of Shafa who have these powers outside of their family? Why'd they pick this bag of shit Maya to be the vessel in which the powers manifest? And does this only apply to the women in the family? Biscuits doesn't get powers? Who wrote this shit? What exactly is the extent of the glowy hand powers? What are they supposed to do? We have healing, sure, and apparently super strength, but how exactly does this make Maya any different from Captain America or the Winter Soldier in combat? She just swings her arms around and people go flying. And you mean to tell me power sharing was on the table the whole time? Whoever had the powers from 1830 to 1850 dropped the fucking ball because they would have been super helpful during the trail of fucking tears, either in healing people during the journey or by preventing it entirely by imbuing all of the tribe with superpowers. Shafa, Tuklo, Loak, and Taloa are complete jackasses for not assisting their descendants with understanding the powers that could have prevented numerous tragedies. Remember when Maya had that wound at the beginning of the show? Taloa's powers would have been extra helpful there. Could have healed Bonnie's black eye or, oh, I don't know, healed William and prevented his death. And then Fisk's guys just stand around like doofuses when Bonnie and Chula's hands start glowing. This guy literally had his gun up to Bonnie's head, finger on the fucking trigger, but when Bonnie's hands start glowing, he's just looking around like an oaf. The grandma and Bonnie punch Fisk's guys with literally no opposition. The Choctaw powwow is still going on outside as this triumphant music starts playing as the family starts whooping everyone's ass. Biscuit screams about white people again as he runs over the two vans full of heavily armed criminals with a monster truck without killing them. I don't know what the point of that was if they aren't dead. This performed worse than a gun but you behaved as if it was a better option. They keep flashing this one shot of Shafa on screen that we've seen 11 billion times as the three women fight and I can't help but think that this sequence feels like it's aping the shit out of that one scene in the climax of Top Gun Maverick. Payback, Sam on your nose! Dagger for the baby! Tally, tally! Talk to me, bud! Dagger to the baby! Phoenix, break right! I see it, I see it! See, that scene works because it's supposed to be the culmination of the class's team bonding efforts. They had trouble working together as a team, and through hard work and camaraderie, the team is able to survive against the SAM missiles by watching out for each other. This, on the other hand, feels cheap. What are we supposed to gather from this? Choctaw woman power is amazing? Family? What is the culmination here? It plays music like everything is coming together when it's the exact opposite. All the themes of this show and all the character writing are in completely different zip codes. Also, bad guys, hey, hey, listen. Take out your guns and shoot them. Zane stands perched high on his RV, somehow not drawing the attention of anyone while being armed with an RPG launcher. Henry draws his Glock and screws on a suppressor, and nobody notices. It's like the civilians and the superhero-related characters are in parallel universes that don't interact with each other. Zane notices Henry, and right before Henry shoots him, this happens. Wait, what? Ugh. Brother, ugh. What's that? What the fuck was that wink? Why did you place this quirky, cartoony twinkle sound when Henry winked? Say it with me again. Dark and grounded. Dark and grounded. Dark and fucking grounded. The RPG flies into the air and explodes and everyone thinks it's fireworks. Absolutely not. There's a difference between a firework that pops to put on a show and an RPG that has enough concussive force to rip a human asunder. Also, super lucky for everyone that the RPG detonated in the air and didn't just come back down like a mortar and blow everyone up. We cut back to Maya and they still haven't pulled out their guns and shot these three losers. None of them are dead. Lay on the ground, draw your Glock and shoot them. We see another shot of- Alright, I get it! Women good, Native Americans good, white man bad, we fucking get it. Fisk finally decides to take matters into his own hands and rushes Maya. 
Maya uses her healing powers on Fisk's chest, and I'm sorry, Vincent, but you kind of just look like you're getting an immaculate sloppy toppy off screen here. Maya then uses her powers on Fisk's head, you know, the, the one on his neck, not the other one, chill out, and he mentally gets transported back to when he was a child and his mother was abused by his father. Maya appears and says that insulting shit again. Let go of the pain. Let go of the anger. Childhood trauma can just be erased with magical Native American powers, apparently. Again, that's not how trauma fucking works. You don't hold on to trauma. Trauma holds on to you. Maya tells him that he is her uncle. So wait, you care about him now? What, what is happening? Fisk screams that he is not who Maya wants him to be and he picks up the incorrect hammer from under a pillow, signifying that this is indeed supposed to be the hammer he killed his father with because this is how he remembers the hammer in his memories. For some reason, Maya is fucking crying for Fisk here when this is in no way earned in any capacity. She has hated this man for the entire series, and Taloa placing her glowing hands on Maya's chest is not going to persuade me that she changed her mind. She asks him to give her the hammer, the symbol of his trauma. This is why I hate artsy-fartsy metaphorical struggles concerning mental health and trauma. It has to be dumbed down and simplified so that the analogy is a one-for-one one with the situation. The hammer equals the pain, but there's nothing here that represents the reality of what Fisk probably went through. The walking on eggshells, the restless nights worrying about his mother, the feeling of helplessness that comes from being a child, watching a grown man beat the shit out of your mother, and fearing that you are next. Fisk's backstory worked much better when it was a literal depiction of abuse. It was earnest, realistic, and relates to a lot of people's reality. That's what made it such a haunting backstory in the first place. It was eerily realistic. Making the hammer the sole symbol of Fisk's trauma from his childhood simplifies it to a childish degree. Let go of the hammer and you can heal. It's not that simple. That childhood trauma is the ground zero for the man Fisk becomes later in his life. Many of his behaviors stem from that trauma. To pretend that the behaviors Fisk has learned over the past decades can all be unlearned and Fisk can be healed by just going back to that moment and making him take back his actions is a slap in the face. Fisk refuses to give Maya the hammer and Maya releases his mind. And here comes the funniest part of the entire series for all the wrong reasons. What did you do? And he just leaves. That's it. Fisk is done in the show. That was the climactic final battle of the show. <sighs> I might as well down this entire bottle, dude. So Fisk just lets Maya go after her magic trick? Why? What what exactly happened? How was the finale of this show such a gigantic wet fart? There's no closure, no true defeat of the kingpin. He just gets told to let go of his trauma and he doesn't. So, now what? The police arrive, but they don't do anything. And that's the end of the climax. Good lord. We fade into Maya's childhood home and we have a flashback of Taloa and Maya releasing the biscuit that Maya punted like a little piece of shit freak. More obnoxious music plays for the second time in this episode as Maya remembers her childhood when her mother and father were both alive and everyone was happy. She rides off on her motorcycle the next morning, seemingly skipping town again. We see Chula, Biscuits, Henry, and Bonnie having a little cookout, and it's all smiles except for Bonnie. L look at this shot. Why focus on Bonnie with this shot that implies she's wistfully thinking about Maya? We see the Tamaha mural again because this show only has four ideas, but Marvel Studios thought it was a good idea to make an entire show with a total runtime of 3 hours and 22 minutes around these four ideas. And of course, Maya isn't skipping town, she's visiting her family. Look at Bonnie's expression here. It's like she's checking Maya out when she arrives. Nobody looks at their fucking cousin like that. Anyways, everyone is happy to see Maya and the show is finally over. Question. What about Scully? So Chula is okay with the brother of her son-in-law that got her daughter killed being at her home, but not the ex-husband who she had at least two children with and she seems to be okay with? 
and narratively, it seems odd to exclude him from the finale. Scully's last scene really was the pawn shop scene at the beginning of the episode. Was Graham Greene not available for this scene? What happened? Fuck him, I guess. Well, I lied to you because we have one last scene during the credits. Fisk explains that he needs to stabilize the situation before it spirals out of control. W what situation? I have no fucking clue. Fisk takes interest in a new broadcast brought to us by Spectrum News. Fisk seems to ponder the idea of becoming mayor of New York. But what is most fascinating is the precise verbiage the news anchors use. Take a listen. Describe their ideal candidate. It turns out most voters want somebody who is a fighter. Which works against the career politician. Exactly right. A bare knuckle brawler would do well in this race. An outsider. Somebody who is not afraid to take on the establishment. A candidate who's a fighter? Working against career politicians? An outsider? Somebody not afraid to take on the establishment. That sounds rather familiar, doesn't it? Now take a listen to these clips. You say the establishment is against you. Why do you say that? Well, I think the establishment actually uh, is against me, but really coming online. I'm supporting Donald Trump because I asked this very simple question. How has it been going the last 30 years with governors and senators and career politicians being president? And then I take it this White House, we're going to fight like hell, I'll tell you right now. Really, guys? You weirdos really are stuck in 2016. You're going to make Wilson Fisk the Donald Trump of the MCU? The quote-unquote anti-woke crowd is right. That man winning broke your minds and you all have never recovered. You're stuck in a trauma loop, reliving 2016 over and over again, playing out fantasies of alternate timelines where Trump didn't win in fiction, painting your ideological opponents as villains so you can depict them as unrealistic straw man caricatures of real people for brownie points from your elitist friends, knee slapping from media sycophants, and masturbatory praise. You all need to grow the fuck up, get therapy, and get over it. And with that, this diseased cock of a show is finally over. My after show thoughts are going to be brief as there's at least two hours of my thoughts on it before this. This is one of the most boring MCU projects I have ever watched. It also manages to be utter dog shit at the same time. These writers don't understand tension, drama, or character driven storytelling. The darker and edgier selling point of this show is a huge empty sham of a gimmick. Other than the extra blood in the fight scenes, there's nothing in this show that warranted a TVMA rating. This show is what a 14 year old boy thinks dark means, and they are trying so, so hard to do that. Look at how Maya slams this guy's head into the floor. She's grimacing so hard trying to convince us that she's the most badass, edgy character ever. Take it down a notch, Infinite. Most of the characters clearly needed to be in the show, but the writers didn't know how to explore them or their relationship with Maya. Bonnie and Maya's reunion doesn't mean anything because we don't know how Bonnie really feels about Maya ghosting her. We don't know why Maya doesn't want to be involved with her family. Chula's reason for disowning Maya is paper thin and doesn't get explored. Say what you will about the Marvels, but at least the Annihilator explained why she emotionally couldn't go back to Earth, even though it was a fucking lie. Chula just says, I couldn't look at you. Why? Explain! This series was the epitome of say so much and nothing at all at the same time. Characters go on long diatribes about nothing and you'd walk away with very little information. Your dialogue should be informative and engaging. All killer, no filler. Fisk's almost simp-like devotion to Maya makes no sense. We never saw the moment where Fisk formed a connection to Maya. There's a chunk of story missing between the shot where Fisk pinches young Maya's cheek and the part where Fisk beats up the ice cream man for being mean to Maya. There's no moment where we see the sparkle in Fisk's eyes that establishes why he loves Maya so much. This show was advertised using scenes from Hawkeye that didn't even show up in the Echo show proper. Even a shot of Fisk sitting next to Maya was in one of her flashbacks, but never appeared in the proper context in this show. The show is dependent on you watching Hawkeye to understand Fisk's devotion to Maya, which is bad storytelling for a show that is supposed to be self-contained within the Marvel Spotlight banner. Now on to Maya. 
Maya is a piece of shit opportunistic asshole who only speaks to her family when it's convenient. She uses every person in her family at least once in the five episode run. She's an unlikable, aloof, above it all, self-serious clown who can't even be humble enough to let someone make a joke about her. Scully's joke about painting her leg guard in matte black would have been a prime opportunity to show the audience that Maya has a crumb of humility and self-awareness, but nope, she has to one-up her grandfather. I didn't even realize that Maya's objective changed between the end of Hawkeye and the beginning of Echo. She originally just wanted to get out of the Kingpin Empire, but the show changed it so that she now wants to take over the Empire. It would have worked better if Maya was on the run throughout the show. The production of this show was obviously a gigantic mess. Much like Age of Extinction, most of this show was created in post. For example, there are several strange attempts to make Maya feel brawnier and weightier than she actually is through the unnecessary addition of thuds, clangs, and thumps in post, or her slamming things for no reason. Yeah, no, your hand wouldn't make that sound if you hit a hard floor. I don't even know why you did that, because you could have broken your hand slamming it on the floor in frustration. The editing in this show is sensory gibberish. There's weird cuts, blunders, CGI, visual effects, green screen, and ADR all over the place. What is this? CGI water? CGI glass? An added muzzle flash for no reason? A child with shoes that make the sound of a grown woman's heels? This show had five different editors, by the way. Another obvious reality is that this show is as cobbled together as one of those ransom notes pasted together using magazine clippings. There was a whole ass subplot that got cut out where Maya was supposed to try and convince Fisk that she was still loyal to him, which only creates more questions, by shooting Henry, but it would later be revealed that she did so non-lethally. Think about that. A whole subplot deleted from production. How much other footage could have been scrapped if a whole subplot is gone? I've already discussed the fact that it seems like Bonnie and Maya were originally supposed to be a couple. You can see how they edited this show to make Bonnie Maya's cousin instead of her paramour. Now we're going to start spitballing some theories because there's actually quite a fascinating web that could be weaved here. As a comment pointed out, there's a possibility that Disney reshot and edited this show to remove the lesbian romance due to the release of the South Park special, Joining the Panderverse, but I find it unlikely because the timelines don't quite match up. Echo would have been in post-production when South Park released that special. However, I have heard of crazy situations where movies were still being edited all the way up until the red carpet premiere, such as, again, Age of Extinction. We also have another comment that stated that Alakwa and the crew were rumored to have beef because she put on a few pounds before reshoots and she no longer fit in the costume she wears. Now take this into account. Alakwa Cox announced her pregnancy on Mother's Day of 2023. But again, the timelines don't match up. She announced her pregnancy in May of 2023. But that was also the month that it was revealed that there were copious reshoots prior. This also means the show was not edited in response to the Pandaverse episode of South Park. So if none of this shit adds up, what the fuck happened to this show? I genuinely need an expose on this show because the depths of ineptitude on display here is creating a new obsession in me. Moving on, I want to talk about the tone and intention of this show. It's clear from the marketing that they intended to make this show darker and edgier with a more grounded tone. But the problem is that this show is the Shadow the Hedgehog of the MCU, as I alluded to before. What do I mean by this? Let's take a look at the darker and edgier description on the Shadow the Hedgehog TV Tropes page. Darker and edgier downplayed. Shadow the Hedgehog is darker than previous franchise entries mostly in terms of aesthetics. For all its posturing, there really isn't anything in this game that comes close to being as unnervingly morbid as Gerald's diary and execution speech from SA2. Most of the plot is only as grim as Adventure 2, Black Doom's behavior, and to serve man plan notwithstanding. The game's mood is primarily brought about by darker textures, even the springs look like they belong in a M-rated game, environments, and the use of mild cursing and guns. Did that just describe Echo or what? 
Echo is a very shallow and immature show when you really get down to it. There's nothing in this show aside from the added blood and its violence that would be inappropriate to show in a PG-13 movie. You know a movie that would be R-rated no matter if you cut out the violence and swearing? It's a movie we already discussed. Joker from 2019 is genuinely one of the darkest comic book movies ever made. I am a firm believer that even if you edited out the blood and language, this film would still need an R rating solely for the depressing topics and themes it discusses. There are themes of suicide, mental illness, child abuse, and all the harsh realities of society. Let's begin by talking about how society put this man through it all. Arthur looked up to comedian Murray Franklin and wanted to follow in his footsteps as a comedian. After he bombs at a comedy club and Murray shows his failed routine on his show, Arthur becomes disillusioned by this. He viewed Murray as his father figure. In his daydreams, he imagined Murray telling him he was the son he never had. He practically worshipped the man, and to have his hero, his idol, spit in his face for millions to see, it must shake a man to the core. Then we find out that his mother isn't even his biological mother. She adopted him and let her boyfriend abuse both of them, chaining him up to a radiator while neglecting him. He was beaten to the point that he formed a traumatic brain injury that caused him to laugh at inappropriate times. Then there's the commentary on how society treats the mentally ill. This is probably the darkest theme in the film. It holds up a mirror to ourselves and shows us how hypocritical we are about the mentally ill. How many viral videos of weird people have you seen that make fun of somebody for behaving outside the social norms? Or even worse, a video making fun of somebody who is clearly not mentally well. But Joker asks the question, what does it feel like to be that other person? The film takes its time showing us how difficult it is to be someone with a mental illness. People don't understand you, they make fun of you, and most importantly, they antagonize you for your decisions when they don't understand what happened. Everyone in the studio of the Murray Franklin show condemns Arthur for killing the Wall Street employees, but nobody knows that they fucking attacked him. And the film doesn't try to depict Arthur as a hero or a villain. The film depicts his actions and circumstances as tragic and horrible. These events shouldn't have happened. They wouldn't have happened if anyone for a second would have treated Arthur with a crumb of decency. Even his own mother shat on his dream of becoming a comedian. Everybody's telling me that my stand-up's ready for the big clubs. But Happy, what makes you think you could do that? Mm -hmm. Don't you have to be funny to be a comedian? He spared Gary because he was the only person who was ever nice to him. That's how all of this could have been avoided. The film is saying that you are responsible for the creation of Arthur and people like him. The callous society that has no sympathy for people that aren't like yourselves. Anyone who has a weird aspiration, an odd quirk, or an emotional outburst that doesn't hurt anyone is not worth talking to. Listen to what he says here. All of you... The system that knows so much, you decide what's right or wrong the same way that you decide what's funny or not. The system he's referring to is us. We have collectively decided what is the right way to behave in society and what is not. To give you a lighter and less depressing example of this, Sometimes I wish it was socially acceptable to run in most places like a video game instead of being socially pressured to walk everywhere, lest people judge you for being weird. I would get to my destination faster in less time. It irks me sometimes to feel like I need to walk in a gigantic mall when I could cover so much more ground if I ran. And sure, I could run, but in the age of everyone whipping out their phones to record the latest viral video, how quickly would I be made a pariah because I'm the guy that runs everywhere? As Arthur writes in his journal, The worst part about having a mental illness is people expect you to behave as if you don't. A statement that sent chills down my spine the first time I saw the film. I'm not saying that criticizing your audience is the key to making things darker. What makes this movie dark is the blurring of your typical black and white morals, your understanding of people and their motives. Arthur does bad things, but you see how the world puts him through the ringer. Arthur is a strange man, but he is cruelly ostracized by the people around him simply for being different. There's a ton of nuance here. With Echo, there's no nuance, no blurring of morals or values. Maya's motive is straightforward and selfish. 
Maya is never depicted as someone who does bad things or someone who is in the wrong. The show constantly portrays Maya in the best light possible. See, she didn't cut her family off, they abandoned her. She wasn't an unquestioning attack dog who killed dozens of people. Fisk is the monster for killing Maya's father. She didn't use and abuse her family, she... well, she... she just didn't, okay? They did the very thing they shouldn't have done. They turned Maya into a hero by the end of the series. She gets her sins metaphorically washed away by her ghost mom and goes on to save her family. She tries to redeem her uncle by trying to erase his trauma. Alakwa Cox even seems to think Maya will join the fucking Avengers. I, <laughs> I highly doubt it, but anyways, taking this obviously villainous character and trying to pretend that all the evil and messed up shit she did doesn't matter at the end of the day because she's a hero is incredibly insulting. She didn't have a redemption arc like Loki did. She didn't even apologize for any of the shit she did. The show just holds a gun up to your head and says, Maya's a hero now. Don't say another goddamn word. <sighs> the show is a sign of something depressing. I think the MCU is genuinely, quantifiably, objectively, creatively bankrupt in the worst way. The heads seem to think that they have a working formula like with Iron Man, but this new formula post-Endgame never did work. How many shows or movies have we had now where they begin with an idea that seems different from the ones before, but devolves into a wham bam thank you ma'am deal where the main character suits up in a snazzy new outfit and has a sludge fest fight, possibly with a bunch of goons? Moon Knight is different, I hear you say. Is it though? So what could this show have been? God, I kind of don't even know how this could be fixed. To be honest, I don't even know if I want to do this. But I said I'd do a rewrite, so I'm gonna have to give it a shot real quick. After all, I'm a man of my word. <laughs> Let's see. If you watched my rewrite of Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League, you may remember that I gave myself a few rules before rewriting that story. In this case, I'm doing something a little different. Alongside the rules I'm shackling myself to, there are also two gigantic rule sets I need to follow. Hawkeye and Daredevil. Yes, the Hawkeye show made Fisk a complete goofball and includes a scene that should have been the death of him, but the reality is, is that this is supposed to be a connected universe. You need to acknowledge what came before, even if you hated it. This drastically inhibits what I can do while trying my best to accomplish what I think the goals of Marvel Studios were. So here are the rules. Kingpin has to be involved. Since he has been cast in Daredevil Born Again, he has to be alive. The tone must stay the same. Marvel wanted a darker show, so the show remains this way. The show still needs to be about Maya's family. The show was initially developed with the idea of exploring Maya's origin story and her family is a part of that origin. Maya has to end the show as a hero, because that's clearly what Marvel wanted despite what they told us before release. I'm also going to try my best to make my story have as similar of a premise as possible because I want to challenge myself. By that, I mean that Fisk wants Maya to rule over his empire in some capacity. Let me know if it works. I'm not confident I can do it with this premise, honestly. Now let's begin. Our story would start similarly to how the actual show starts. There is no flashback of the first Choctaw woman drinking a galaxy or anything like that. The first shot would be of Maya having a sleepover with her friend Bonnie and having lots of fun. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. You see, Bonnie and Maya are friends for a particular reason. More on that later. We get the original story, but instead of everything being hunky-dory with the adults, there is a hint of animosity between Chula and William. Chula states that she is starting to warm up to William, but he's not out of the woods yet. Scully and Chula leave, and there's no stupid-ass Biskinik to foreshadow something bad happening. There also isn't that conversation that Scully and Chula have about the ancestors. Why? Because we're going to reveal more about Scully and Chula's relationship later since they aren't getting a divorce. So the story continues as it did before. Bonnie and Maya come inside due to the rain and Maya wants hot chocolate. 
Instead of it just being Maya and Taloa, because it would be weird to leave Bonnie alone at home while her friend leaves to get hot chocolate, we'll have Maya, Taloa, and Bonnie go to the store together. But instead of the reality-breaking cut break lines plot device, we have Taloa get in the truck to start the engine before the kids and it explodes, killing her instantly and dismembering Maya. This makes it instantly apparent that Malice was involved. We also have Bonnie here because we need to have her see what Maya went through. In the show proper, the two never discuss Taloa's death, or Williams for that matter. Allowing Bonnie to see this moment can create character moments later down the line. The next day, Maya is in the hospital and William is confronted by Chula, just like in the show. You may be noticing that I'm keeping a lot of the stuff from the actual show's first episode. That's because most of it is actually usable and can work with a bit of retooling. The original conversation happens, but instead of William being told to leave, he willingly offers to leave while Chula says that she doesn't want William taking away her only granddaughter. William insists. Also, instead of redundantly telling Maya that her mother is dead, William brings in Bonnie and her mother to visit Maya. Bonnie brings her a Get Well Soon card and a stretchy bracelet made of beads. Maya smiles as she takes the bracelet, not knowing what is going to happen in the near future. Now, you might be thinking, why would Bonnie's mother let her be anywhere near Maya's family after the explosion? Because Bonnie's mother was told it was just a freak accident rather than crime beef collateral damage. Bonnie and her mother leave, and Maya is told the reality. They are going to be leaving Tamaha soon. We then would get Bonnie and Maya's final play date, where the two would look glum when the doorbell rings, as they know that it will probably be the last time they see each other. The two hug, and Bonnie leaves as Maya cries. Note that the relationship between Bonnie and Maya is strictly platonic at this point, but the hug transitions into a romantic one in Maya's mind as she gets older. Maya is taken to New York City as we know, and her father is killed per Hawkeye. Instead of Fisk appearing to unarrest Maya after she does the, the thing, Maya would text Fisk and arrange to meet him, as she only has him to look to for consultation. Fisk would then offer her a job and she would accept. Instead of whatever we got in the show, Maya is given a job being head of security for an armory, the same armory that she blew up in the real show. She would be in the office watching cameras Five Nights at Freddy's style as her lieutenant, who knows ASL, would issue all commands to the guards verbally. This is when you would get your daredevil cameo that Disney so desperately wanted in this show. Maya would see a guard get yeeted on camera by something just out of view. She would go to investigate and confront Daredevil. She would sick the guards on him using non-ASL gestures as she also joins in on the fight. Daredevil beats the brakes off the guards as he would, but when he gets to Maya, he sees her face the same way he saw Karen's face in the Daredevil show. As he sees the world engulfed in flames, he would see Maya's face in a world of fire, a world of crime. He takes pause and grabs Maya's collar. He would say, you're young, you shouldn't be in this mess. In this version, Maya can read lips because she was able to in Hawkeye. Daredevil hears the sound of a pistol being drawn from a holster. He rushes away from Maya to fight the goons with guns. Out of fear, Maya flees. Fisk would summon her to him and would be less disappointed than he usually would. Maya would be upset that Fisk didn't tell her that she could be put up against the Devil of Hell's kitchen. Fisk says that he was molding her to go up against Daredevil, but their paths intertwined too soon. Fisk needed his own Daredevil after he failed to manipulate Bullseye. He saw the potential Maya had and wanted to awaken it. For the sake of answering a question most would have, Bullseye got blipped, so he's MIA for the time being. Side note, wouldn't it be cool if Daredevil had beef with Ronan because he was killing people just like the Punisher? We get a montage of Maya training and taking down more and more of Fisk's enemies. During this montage, we see that Maya is ignoring texts from Chula and Scully. Her father did not tell her the nature of why they moved to New York, so she is under the assumption that they pushed her father and her away rather than the reality that William willingly left Tamaha and that it was because of his criminal connections that her mother was killed. She also has kept the bracelet that Bonnie gave her all these years. It represents something I will get to later. Then the events of Hawkeye occur. Maya fights Clint, learns Fisk killed her father, and we get a reminder that Maya wanted to get out of the Kingpin Empire, something she stated when she fought Kazi. 
Did anyone even notice that Echo never mentioned this character who was Maya's close friend throughout the five episodes? Let's change that. After Maya shoots Fisk, she flees for Tamaha, Oklahoma because there is one person she believes can get her out of the Kingpin Empire, her uncle Henry Lopez. On the road trip to Oklahoma, Maya is attacked by Fisk's men. Why? Well, since Hawkeye never outright confirms otherwise, Kazi is still alive, and he is interrogated by Fisk's goons as to where Maya is. As shown in his final scene in Hawkeye, Kazi is deathly afraid of betraying Fisk, so he spills the beans. He curses himself for being a coward, but he was too afraid to die. We can then put Kazi in our back pocket to save him for another project where he redeems himself or something. Also in this version, Fisk is the one who directly ordered his men to bring Maya to him. As Maya continues to flee, there comes a point where the Fisk goons stop chasing. Maya doesn't question it, she just continues to head to Tamaha. When she arrives, Maya parks her motorcycle outside of Henry's skating rink and waits with her tinted helmet on. At this point, she has ditched helmets and clothes several times to avoid being recognized. After closing time, Maya approaches the back entrance, still in full gear, and knocks on the door. Henry opens it and tells her that they're closed. In this version, Henry is slightly older and a bit of a curmudgeon. He's bitter and has been alone for decades. After his brother died, he simply decided to keep his head down and work until he keels over and expires. Henry is trying to shoo Maya away, but Maya signs the word wait in ASL. Henry freezes as Maya opens her visor. He recognizes Maya's eyes. Henry hurries her inside where she finally removes her helmet. In this version, Henry is still the head of a train depot, but the explanation for why Fisk's operations go all the way to Oklahoma is because Henry is the head of a smuggling ring that sneaks weapons into the US, and more specifically New York, from over the southern border. Henry asks what Maya is doing here and she says that she needs his help to make her disappear. Fisk killed her father. She has no one, and the only people she could trust betrayed her. Henry was told William was killed, but in this version, he didn't know Fisk arranged it. This is the catalyst for why he helps Maya. He has no loyalty to Fisk after he killed his brother. Henry knows that this is going to get dicey. He tells Maya to lay low while he works on a way to get her out, and once she's out, he's leaving next. Henry advises Maya to reach out to Chula to gain access to her childhood home. Maya says she has her own way in. We cut to Maya arriving at her old home where she remembers the night Bonnie and her had a sleepover. She picks the lock to the back door and enters. To her surprise, she finds all of the decor exactly the way it was left. If you need an explanation, the home was in Taloa's name because William didn't want his name attached to the house due to his connections putting his family at risk. Despite trying to keep his home disconnected from himself, his enemy still found out where he lived. When Taloa died, the custody of the house was passed over to Chula and Scully. In the home, Maya sees the picture of her and Bonnie when they were children. She then has a flashback to when they met. Maya was lonely as a child because most of the students didn't know ASL, so she couldn't make friends. Bonnie would approach Maya and wave. She would then sign the phrase, Are you okay? Maya is shocked and asks how Bonnie knows sign language, and she says that her father is deaf. Through an understanding of ASL and hearing disabilities, Bonnie and Maya form a friendship. We return to the present and Maya has a single tear going down her face. She wishes her life went in a different direction than what she was forced to suffer through. Maya hears the door unlock and she grips her pistol and prepares to draw. This pistol is still a 1911 in this version. Why? Because she lost her Beretta in a fight with Fisk goons and scooped up this gun from one she killed. You know, the obvious solution the actual show never considers explaining to us. It is revealed that the person at the door is Scully. We are removing Biscuits entirely because he doesn't really serve a purpose in developing Maya's character. He might still exist in this universe, but I'm not bringing him into this story. Scully was dropping by to do some maintenance on the house. Shocked to see his granddaughter for the first time in about 15 years, Scully is stunned silent. Much like Biscuits in the actual show, Scully signs to Maya, calling her by name. Maya has no words. She still believes that her family abandoned her. Scully hugs his granddaughter, but Maya does not reciprocate. Scully makes no mention of it. He doesn't question how Maya got in here. He's just so excited to see his granddaughter again. He states that it's good to finally see her again and says that they missed her. 
Maya cocks her head back and signs, Did you now? Scully, confused, would simply confirm this. Maya has an inquisitive expression and asks Scully what happened after she left. Scully explains that the death of Taloa was hard on everyone, including Bonnie. Maya shows disbelief that Bonnie is still in Tamaha. Scully says that she's an EMT that also volunteers in the community and helps out at the powwows. Scully says that she should come see Chula, but Maya says that she doesn't have enough time. She's here for quote-unquote work. Scully nods and says that he understands. He's just here to do some maintenance on the lights and he'll be gone. He tells Maya to make herself at home and get some rest as the ride by motorcycle must have been tiring. The next day we get the scene where Maya discreetly parks her motorcycle near the fire station and watches Bonnie play basketball with her co-workers. It would be the exact same scene so I don't need to elaborate much here, but now it makes more sense for Maya to have a saddened, wistful expression and for Bonnie to have this awareness of Maya's presence. Back in New York City, it would be revealed that Fisk survived the gunshot, because I unfortunately have to include this, and is about to be on his way to Tamaha after fully recovering from his injury. Henry texts Maya and tells her to meet him at the skating rink after hours to go over his plan. Maya visits Scully's pawn shop to stock up on ammo, but Scully simply thinks Maya is going to go shooting at the range. Maya takes interest in the statue of Shafa, and Scully explains that Shafa was a courageous warrior who fought valiantly to protect the Choctaw people. Notice that I did not make Shafa the first Choctaw woman. This version of Shafa would simply be a warrior of legend who is viewed more as a mythological legend rather than a godlike being. Scully says that Shafa is a direct ancestor of Chula and by extension Maya. Maya scoffs at the idea of believing a myth. In this scene, Maya would also begin to warm up to Scully as it becomes clear that he loves her and is extremely excited to see her. She would make jokes, ask questions, and express interest in the happenings of Tamaha. Later that night, Henry and Maya meet at the skating rink and begin to go over the plan. During this conversation, Henry would get a call. He says that it's important. He answers the phone and we see Henry's conversation from Maya's perspective. No audio, but we can see the expression on Henry's face change from neutral to shocked to anxious. When he hangs up, he signs to Maya to stay here as he leaves the office to tend to something. While he's gone, Maya peeks out the window to see two SUVs parked outside. We switch over to Henry's perspective where we see Fisk arrive in the flesh with his entourage. Fisk explains to Henry that his niece is a person of interest to him and he needs to speak with her. Henry lies to Fisk and Fisk is not convinced. Fisk grabs him by the throat and asks if Henry thinks he's stupid. He tells him that he will find Maya whether he helps or not. What Henry can do is decide whether he lives or dies. Henry slips up and glances at the office door and Fisk drops Henry with a smirk. Fisk tells his men to check the office. They open the door and... Maya is not there. Suddenly loud music starts blasting from the speakers just like in the actual show. Maya, being deaf, means she's immune to loud music and can cover her attacks under the sound of the music. She just won't be busting through wooden walls and shit like she does in the actual show. Fisk orders his men to find Maya. We get a sequence where Maya takes down Fisk's men stealthily one by one, but is eventually spotted. All of Fisk's men are defeated, but Fisk rips apart the sound system with his bare hands. He yells Maya's name right before he shoots Henry in the shoulder. Maya runs out with her hands up. Fisk smirks. Fisk gestures to Maya with rudimentary ASL, explaining that he just wanted to talk. He explains that he has a proposition for Maya. Before Fisk can explain what the proposition is, the sound of emergency sirens can be heard. Maya smirks as she signs that she texted 911 and Henry translates it for Fisk. Fisk thinks quickly. He drops the gun and turns his back to Maya and Henry. As the police enter, Fisk shoots his hands into the air and decries that his own goons were trying to rob the place, and they shot Henry. He tells them that he managed to disarm the thug that did it. Maya and Henry are in disbelief. Fisk asks for the sergeant on duty, and he briskly leaves the skating rink. As Fisk leaves, Bonnie enters with a stretcher and her co-workers. She meets eyes with Maya, and the two stare at each other as the world around them fades away. Bonnie is snapped out of it as her co-worker urges her to help Henry onto the stretcher. Maya, Henry, Bonnie, and the EMTs leave the skating rink and enter an ambulance. Fisk is conversing with the police sergeant and he makes eye contact with Maya, smirking as she leaves. 
In the ambulance, Maya and Bonnie talk as Henry has been stabilized. Bonnie asks Maya how she and her father have been. Maya explains that William is dead. Bonnie offers her condolences and wishes she could have been there for Maya. Maya says she wishes Bonnie was there too because nothing has been the same since she was taken from Tamaha. The only person who she could trust as much as Bonnie betrayed her trust and she has been alone since. Bonnie says that Maya doesn't have to be alone anymore, then she touches Maya's hand. Maya looks at Henry, then back at Bonnie. Maya says that she can't, she'll just hurt Bonnie. Seeing Henry's injury as her fault, Maya doesn't want the same for Bonnie. Henry intrudes and asks Bonnie if any of them saw his phone. Just as Henry asks this question, Maya gets a text message from Henry's phone. It says, you're smart. Good. I need you to be smart for what comes next. Maya grows pale. At the hospital, Henry is sedated and operated on. Maya and Bonnie are in the hallway conversing. Bonnie asks Maya what happened at the skating rink. Maya says that she can't tell her she doesn't want Bonnie swept up in this mess. Maya tells her to stay away because this is much deeper than she realizes. She says it was nice seeing Bonnie again, but she must bid her farewell. Maya goes back home and sees Scully's truck in the front. She enters the house and, to her surprise, Chula is sitting on the sofa. Maya asks Chula why she is here. Chula says that she could ask the same question. Chula grills Maya for ignoring them when they were only trying to help. Maya says that they pushed her and her father away. Chula reveals that William chose to leave. She says that William felt guilt for the death of Taloa. She admits that she grilled him and may have pushed him into making the decision. Maya asked why he would have any guilt. Chula reveals to Maya that Taloa didn't die in a freak accident. She died because of William's criminal activity. See, this seems a bit redundant and doesn't feel like much of a reveal, but the intention here is not to reveal information to the audience as a means to shock them. This is a matter of dramatic irony. Maya was in the dark for a lot of this. The investment from the audience is not from learning the secret, but from Maya's potential reaction. In some stories, the reaction is the spoiler. Maya, learning that her own father kept secrets from her about her childhood, is in disbelief. And here's the theme being addressed. Chula says that she wanted to keep Maya here. Scully and her almost divorced in the aftermath. But they realize that neither of them should be suffering alone after the death of their daughter. And Chula would tell Maya that she can see in her eyes that she's been suffering alone, pushing people away when that's the last thing she should be doing. Maya signs that she has no one. Her father is dead. Henry is in the hospital. And everyone else has betrayed her. Chula shakes her head. She says that Maya always had her. Chula stands up and hugs her granddaughter. Later that night, Maya watches the news on her phone. Chula has left for the night. Maya's phone has live captioning, so there are captions transcribed live for everything she watches. While watching, she receives another text message from Henry's phone. All that's in the message is a link to a YouTube video and the phrase, watch this, under it. Maya reluctantly watches the video. It's a news story on the events from the skating rink. Fisk has orchestrated his own spin of the events. The police sergeant that Fisk was talking to held a press conference that lauded Fisk's bravery in saving an old man and a deaf woman from being victims of gang activity. But the news story ends with a shocking twist. Fisk is running for mayor of New York City and this lie has gotten him positive press. Seemingly as if Fisk knew Maya had finished watching the video, he texts her again. The message says, Your uncle is in room 397 in Haskell Regional, the Choctaw Casino, tomorrow morning, or he dies. The next day, Maya meets Fisk at the casino. He has his men stand at the ready and his ASL interpreter is by his side. He says that he understands that Maya is upset, but everything has its reasons. Maya asks why Fisk killed her father. Fisk explains that she wouldn't understand. Besides, he's not here to talk about old news. He wants to discuss his proposition. Fisk is running for office and he needs someone who knows the empire's ins and outs and someone he can trust to run his empire while he focuses on his mayoral run. His empire is going to get a lot bigger and Maya is going to want to be on the winning side. He says he'll even forgive Maya for the mark she left him. Maya asks why she should even join him. Not only did he kill her father, not only does he not know ASL, but he didn't even mention Maya to Vanessa, a woman he loves. Maya asks if he was ashamed of her. Fisk clears his throat. 
Clearly ruffled by Maya's comments, Fisk explains that he is clearly trying to learn ASL. It can't all be learned in a day. And Vanessa doesn't need to be brought into this. A statement he says with a sense of pain, as if he remembered a painful memory. He decides to digress, stating that Maya needs to make a choice. Maya has a decision. Continue her path and fly off the radar, or go back on her values and return with Fisk. She says that she needs to gather her things at home. Fisk smiles and says for her to meet him at the airport. Maya lied. She rushes to the hospital to warn Henry. Henry tells her to go to the train yard and get in the red train car labeled 9Z72. Maya asks about him and he says that he's going to be discharged soon so he'll be safe shortly. Maya makes her way to the train yard as quickly as she can and she prepares to load her bike onto the train car when... <laughs> Maya slowly pulls out her phone and she sees a text message. It's from Henry's phone again. This time, it's a picture of Bonnie handcuffed with a rifle aimed at her head. Time is ticking, the message reads. Maya has a rock in her throat. The fear she had was coming true. Maya rushes to the airport and confronts Fisk on the tarmac. It's just her, Fisk, Bonnie, and the man with the rifle. Fisk brews with anger as he makes Bonnie translate for him. He says, did you think I wouldn't catch you? Do you play me for a fool? When will you learn, Maya? I have eyes everywhere. I have ears everywhere. You can't run from me. Maya tells Fisk to let Bonnie leave. Fisk says that won't be happening. Maya tells him that he is ridiculous for thinking that she would go back to him after he killed her father. Fisk nods with a fed up expression. He says that the reason he had William killed is because he didn't deserve Maya. He was hoping that he could have his own daughter with Vanessa, but Vanessa turned to ash in his hands right before his eyes. He suffered alone while William still had Maya. He kept Maya, so he took Maya from William. He gave everything to Maya. He's even prepared to give her even more, but she has betrayed him twice now. Maya points out the twisted, lopsided morality here. She asks if Fisk is allowed to do whatever he wants while Maya is never allowed to criticize. Fisk says it's because he knows what's best, and what is best is that he removes the tumors of Maya's life known as her family, starting with her uncle. Henry is dragged in like a carcass. He is dropped onto the asphalt as he groans. Fisk tells Maya to choose. Now. Maya nods and agrees. She asks that Bonnie and Henry be left alone in return. Fisk agrees. Maya rushes to Bonnie and tells her that she has to go with Fisk, but she will be back. As long as Fisk lives, Bonnie and Maya's family are not safe. Maya slips the stretchy bracelet off of her wrist and slides it onto Bonnie's. With so many emotions and words unable to be said, Maya simply kisses Bonnie on the cheek. Maya requests Bonnie take care of Henry after she leaves. Maya reluctantly boards Fisk's plane. She is cursed to be alone, but she must protect those that she loves. I made this choice because it allows the parallel with Shafa and Maya being protectors in a more symbolic way and without it being a direct one-to-one -one connection. This also ends the story in a darker way than usual. Instead of a one-sided brawl like we usually get, we could instead have a tense conversation where Maya realizes that she's trapped and can't get out so easily simply by making rash and cursory decisions. She also learns that her family is here to support her, but she needs to ensure she can protect them, as there is no one able to defend them like she can. The bracelet Maya gives back to Bonnie symbolizes the perseverance and hopeful promise of a return to Bonnie someday. The plane takes off and Maya watches as Bonnie and Henry are left behind. The obligatory mid credit scene would be a tease of an adaptation of the Devil's Reign storyline where Fisk tells Maya that he plans on banning all masked vigilantes and costume heroes from New York since, as She-Hulk unceremoniously announced, the Sokovia Accords no longer exist. With Heroes banned, Fisk is free to do what he wants, including hunting down Matt Murdock. Oh, I am so glad I'm finally done with this show. With my rewrite, I have quite a few self-criticisms as well, such as the fact that this would probably work better as a movie than a TV show. I'm more of a movie guy myself anyways. Or the fact that Chula and Scully are used a lot less than they probably should. 
or that Bonnie and Maya need their personalities and relationship fleshed out. But that's kind of the problem, isn't it? There is nothing to work with in the actual show. I don't know what these characters are supposed to be. And I erased Maya's powers because they're goofy, ill-defined, and break the story in several places. They create more problems than they fix. And if you want a darker tone, why is the ending of the show such bog-standard MCU slop? For fuck's sake, do something interesting and daring. I don't know, kill off the grandma or something. With Marvel, even the TVMA show has to have an ending straight out of a kid's movie. But there's still one gigantic problem. Maya's mere existence is an unavoidable plot hole. If Fisk cares about Maya so much, why'd he say this in season 3 of Daredevil? You said that for the cost of postage you could prevent my reunion with the only person who gives my life meaning. The premise of Maya being Fisk's adopted niece that he always loved since she was a child is a massive fuck you to his character in the Daredevil show. This could have been mitigated by making one change. Make it so that Maya and Fisk bonded during the blip while Vanessa was blipped. That way, it doesn't fly in the face of what came before. I tried my best to mend that wound in my version, but it's just a gnarly situation to deal with entirely. Whew, okay, I'm not rewriting a story for a video again for a long time. These take quite a bit of time to work on, so I'll save them for when I don't have other projects waiting for me to work on them. But for this show, it's time to bury it. It's needlessly edgy, not very complex, has an asshole of a main character who is treated like the victim, and it overstays its welcome with a bloated runtime and very little in the way of actual content. You may have wondered why I called this the dentist appointment of TV shows, and it's finally time to explain it. With a dentist appointment, you show up and go through the usual process of signing in and waiting for your turn. The dentist sees you, they clean your teeth, do x-rays, give a free toothbrush, and shoo you out with the verbal equivalent of a pat on the ass. But if you're unlucky, you'll need to return because the dentist noticed something was not right. You'll have to get some work done, cavities filled, teeth pulled, or crowns placed. But if you're in that position, expect the next visit to be way longer, way more painful, and way more expensive. And that is this show. If you go in and simply watch it with nothing more than a thoughtless glance, you'll find it boring and inoffensive. But God forbid you find enough things wrong with it to write a review. Combing over this show was a painful chore that took way more than it should have simply because of how much bullshit is in it. This show is the epitome of what happens when you make a show about a character that nobody asked for and nobody really cares about. I can only imagine the Agatha Harkness show is going to be just as tedious to watch. So what's the final word on Echo? Now it's time to bid you all adieu. I want to thank you all for watching and if you'd like to see more, check out this video or one of my other videos. See you next time.